Moore's Charity School. What is it? Is it charity for the night? <laughs> is it more confusion? What's the purpose? What's the purpose of a more charity school? Founded in 1754 in Lebanon, in Lebanon, Connecticut, now Columbia, uh-oh, <laughs> by the Puritan Calvinist minister Eliezer Willard to provide education for Native Americans, All right? So to provide education, what type of education? Oh, for Native Americans who want to be missionaries, right? And start preaching the gospel, the gospel to the Naga tribe. So they can use you, they can convert you, conform you to their beliefs, make you desire it to go then and poison your people's minds. This is the more charity school. This is more psychological warfare on the native indigenous Nagas who the treaties were on and against. Eliezer Willock became involved in education and when Samsung Okun or Kuhn, Kuhn, a Mohegan Native American asked Reverend Willock for instruction. The English school with teacher Eliezer Willock and just one Native student, Samson Okun, transformed Moore's Indian Charity School. From 1750 to early 1770s, 49 Native American boys and 18 Native American girls were educated at the school. Between 1766 and 68, Okun went on fundraising. He went on a fundraising tour in Britain to raise money for the school. The fundraising effort was extremely successful. Raising 12 pounds in donations, Reverend Willock took the fundraising money. <laughs> He said, cool. <laughs> he moved the school's location and used the money to build Dartmouth. Controversy existed. Samson Okum charged all the money has done is made Dr. Willock's family very grand in the world. So even the one native Naga student he had said, yo, this dude just took the money and bounced. What did he do? <laughs> The school survived for only a fairly short time as Connecticut was located far from Native American territories on the frontier of British colonies in North America. And because Willock desired to expand the institution to include a school for Europeans, bang, right? So he came in, fundraising, act like he cared about these Native American boys and girls. He even wanted to bring them Jesus. <laughs> Have them singing in the churches, right? And then he got greedy and said, yo, I want to do this for the Europeans. Because <laughs> they need more land. They need, they need more stuff, right? They need more. So the truth came out, right? He used us to raise money got your money, got your donations. Even your one Indian said, uh, hey man, all the money has done, all the money has done is it has made Dr. Willock family very grand. Man. It, it made them come up because who knows how much more money they raised on the back end, you know, after they had this on the front end, you know what I'm saying? Anyway, I mean, Either way, hey, good for them, man. Let them have their uh, missionary college, which became an Ivy League college in Dartmouth. And how many times this situation repeated? How many of these Ivy League schools were originally conceived as Indian schools and Indian colleges with one purpose, one desire to make these 
Native tribes missionaries. To make these nagas out of their damn mind. Biological chemical weapons, man. <laughs> to weaponize them, to weaken them, so that they don't care about their tribe no more, man. They care about whatever mission you're giving them now. There's one uh, quote from one of these tribal leaders, you know, when their tribesmen, you know, came back from the college. Their their young ones came back from the college. They said, "Man, they're no good to us. They can't, they can't hunt. They they can't. They don't, they don't know how to, you know, start a fire. Like they don't know how to fight. They can't do nothing. They they can't do nothing to make sure we survive. Yeah, they can spread the gospel. That's about all they can do." This was the purpose of the Moors Indian school, specifically the Moors Indian charity school. This was the forerunner of Dartmouth College, <laughs> which was later established in New Hampshire. Huh? It's at the brainest point of first before we even talk about brand, man, because this is really the whole point of a lot of these schools. I mean, they ain't talking Presta. We got to surf the wave to get on our Presta flow. They, they ain't bringing that up in public school. That ain't the type of education they giving. That, that's not the mission they want to put us on. <laughs> Dig it on die. We, your commandments, my naga. Tribing up. They definitely don't want you tribing up. Oh, no. Oh, no, boss. We're talking about Joseph Brand, right? Ta yandanegya. Tanindanegya. <laughs> I got that Dan in it, man. What's, the, what's this got to do with Danville, man? Uh oh, uh oh. <laughs> Mohawk military political leader based in present day New York, who was closely associated with Great Britain during and after the American Revolution. So the same allies that the Comse was flown with. You know, he already was flown with, right? Perhaps the Native American of his generation, best known in the Americas and British, because he was really dip diplomatic. You know, he was, you know, trying to push different, um, you know, just insights on how to bring these tribes together, man. You know what I'm saying? And the way he was, uh, you know, really mastermind in his way you know it wasn't the Tecumseh way per se but he had his own way you know I, we're reading about him trying to you know study his philosophy but he seems to have a connection you know what I'm saying with the confederate you know tribes of Tecumseh you know um it's, it's hard to tell because you know we just we just weren't there you know what I'm saying we don't know who all these allies are and, you know we don't know who all is in Britain and who all is in this, but the fact that they're at war with these American, so-called Americans, <laughs> these hijacks, you know, straight up from Europe just popping up, you know what I mean? Um, you know, these Brits kind of seem to have, you know, some type of other, you know, solutions or whatnot. And again, we don't know if we're talking about white Brits or, you know, other tribe that would be, you know, a Naga today that's in Britain will be considered British, right? So anytime you hear Britain doesn't mean we ain't talking Nagas. And same thing with an American. You say, oh, he's an American. He could be a, a Naga like me from Inglewood. Like, you know, we don't know. So, you know, don't just, you know, jump out the window because you see British and you see American. Like, we don't, we don't know what the Confederacy was really popping off. What we do know is that it didn't succeed in the end, right? So at the end of the day, you know, via trickery and cowardness and all that other stuff, the Kumse had to take an L. The Confederate tribes under under Big Tech, you know what I mean? They they couldn't tribe up. They couldn't get the rest of the tribe to fight with them. So they had to take an L, right? We had to take an L. Even in our script, we had to take an L. We were put under a Ruach Tarde Ma. We were put to sleep. 
And I believe you're witnessing like that last kick around these 1700s, 1800s, that last press to flow. We ain't gonna be no homeborn slave. I think we're seeing the last of it in these 1800s. And it kept going throughout the 1800s and 1900s, but not the Seminole Wars and the Creek Wars kept going and it continued. You had no time to be no homeborn slave. You was fighting off the hijack, trying to tribe up and you were fighting against these treaty making, you know what I'm saying, traitors to your land that thought that they had the rights to make these treaties and sell off all this land, not even sell it, just give it up. Just give it up. Because they weren't selling it for nothing. They might as well have just been giving it up, man. But they had no right to sell or give your land away. And this is what the Coombs was fighting for. The Fort Wayne Treaty was the last straw, 30 million acres. Nah. He said, man, y'all better not settle on that land that those hijacked tribes thought that they could sell to you. You better not do that, Harrison, Washington. Y'all better not stay one foot on them lands because they had no right to sell this land. Give it up to you. Joseph Brandt, interesting character, man. Interesting character here. Skipping right here, it says, uh, <laughs> That's Katie right here. It says, Brandt, well, let's get the whole thing, the legacy. Brandt acted as a tireless negotiator for the Six Nations to control their land without crown oversight or control. He used British fears of his dealings with the Americans and the French to extract concessions. His conflicts with British administrators in Canada regarding tribal land claims were exacerbated by his relations with the American leaders. So he's kind of playing both sides. You know, this is one side to the story we're reading. We don't really know his side, but let's go. It says Brandt was a war chief and not a hereditary Mohawk sachem. So he wasn't hereditary Mohawk priest, all right? We are talking Prestors, they might call chief or, or sachem. His decisions could be and sometimes were overruled by the sachems and clan matrons. However, his natural ability, his early education, and the connections he was able to form made him one of the great leaders of his people and of the time. The Canadian historian James Paxton wrote that Brandt's willingness to embrace numerous aspects of European culture, his preference for wearing European style clothing, and that he was a devoted member of the Church of England has led to Brandt being criticized for not being sufficiently Indian enough. So his people like, yo, you, you switching up, man. <laughs> Many of the critics would prefer Brandt to have been a leader like the Kumse. Because the Kumse wasn't switching up. Or Pontiac, leading his people into a brave but doomed battle with the white man. Paxton wrote, this line of criticism is based on the erroneous notion of First Nations people being static and unchanging and fails to understand that that a people like the Mohawks could and did change over time. Paxton wrote that Brandt grew up in a world where the Palantines and Scott Irish settlers were his neighbors. And he understood that European colonization was not going to be undone, leading him to attempt to secure the best possible future for his people by seeking an accommodation with the Europeans. 
Mm. Well, you know, I'm not sure where he's still on the Treaty of Fort Wayne or, <laughs> you know, all these. You know, I guess he was involved with the Treaty of Paris that created this halt in the fighting of the Chicago War, Dragon Canoe in there. But, you know, it seemed like he didn't really just want to scrap it out, you know, but he also didn't want, you know, to be disrespected, you know, by the invader either. So I guess he sort of served as a buffer between both sides. But that's a that's a tricky place to be at. Right. The situation of six nations on the Grand River was better than that of the Iroquois who remained in New York. His lifelong mission was to help the Indian to survive the transition. So in his mind, he's doing this for his people want to help them survive this transition that cannot be undone. Tukum said, like, yes, it will be undone. Who's who's going with me? <laughs> so that's the mentality, you know what I'm saying, of both, you know, tribal leaders at this time. But his people wanted him to be more like big tech, right? So he, wa he wanted to help his people survive the transition from one culture to another. Like, yo, it's happening. It's kind of like the day, you know, certain people are like, hey, man, you can't fight it. You know, you, yeah, get, get, the AI is already here, man. You might as well buy your robot right now, man. <laughs> get Buy the best robot dog you can because robot dogs going to be everywhere, man. You might as well, man. Nothing you could do. Hey, and you always got the decode say, no, nah. it's like, shit, man, we're going to make our stand. Like, we, we ain't, we ain't uh, walking into this other matrix. We ain't walking into this metaverse. You know, for us these days, we start with the code because we see you could be strong like the code say. You can have all, you know, I mean, even in the Battle of Thames, you know, T-H-A-M-E-S, where they said the code say, you know, had his last battle. You know, he had 500 Nagas with him, you know. And he went up against 4,500. Still put on a hell of a show. Still put on a hell of a brave you know, uh, last stand, you know. But, uh, I mean, 500 people, I mean, think about whoever you consider a, a super duper shot caller, you know, thug of thugs or not even thug of thugs, but just, you know, you know, one of them movers, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> you ain't got to be no super thug, but maybe you a shot caller. You know, maybe something goes all the way up. You might be able to imagine this person with a hundred people by their side, a couple hundred, maybe like on call. You know, think about like the uh, like the OGs in these different areas. You know, I think about Jay Prince. You know, shout out Jay Prince. Or, you know, Big U out here. You know, shout out Big U. You know, and, and you know, whatever shot callers. You know, you got Whack One Hundred going around. You know. If someone was to go all the way up, you know, could they make a phone call and get a hundred knockers, you know, immediately 200 knockers? I mean, that'd be pretty strong. I mean, even Malcolm X, you know, something go up, he, he called the nation or he, he called his people, you know, get a couple hundred people up there, something like that, maybe more. I mean, but the coon say, I mean, people ready to die for you, though, and not just march and not just hear a speech, you know, and not just have a scrap not just scare some people, but really like, yo, <laughs> not 500 on, you know, 20 people. I'm talking like 500 knowing that they got to go up, up against 5,000, 500 of them type of niggas, you know what I'm saying? Like, oh, okay, so this is where we're going to do it? Well, let's go. Like, that's a different type of power. 500 Nagas show up ready for anything? 500, like... So even though he was going up against the United States Corporation with their 5,000, I mean, he had to be a, bo a boss of boss, a boss of bosses. To even after all that fight, you know, to still have them type of numbers, you know, on call to, to fight that last fight. So that's what they mean by it. they want him to be like tech, you know what I mean? Just ready for whatever. But he said, nah, there's nothing we can do. You know, he had already made that decision. You know what I'm saying? He 
He wasn't going to fight that type of fight, according to how they breaking it down. But again, we don't know. So we and Wiki, you know, we, we're digging all these ancestors, man. And so I like to bring it up all with respect because I don't know. We don't know. Even when I'm talking push my taha, we, we're taking it from the sources we can gather to put a picture together based on hindsight being 2020. These treaties are real. They execute them even to this day. You know what I'm saying? And we know this Moorish shield situation is true. We know this Moorish connection with these, uh, you know, certain tribes, Psalms 83, you know what I mean, that have been Confederate against Hawass people. Hawass see That we do know. How we got there is what we're trying to backtrack on and put the pieces together. So his attempt to create pan-tribal unity proved unsuccessful. Well, he, he tried it his way. At least he tried it, though. I mean, he didn't have to do this. You know, he tried something. So you got to give him respect because you don't know, you know, those those details. You know what I'm saying? But someone tried to bring the tribes together. Though his efforts will be taken up a generation later with Shawnee leader Tacoma. So Tech really followed the blueprint of this pan tribal unity that Brandt put down, that Joseph Brandt was putting down. And then maybe militarize it more, you know, that type of thing. But you got to respect where you got it from. You got to, it must be something respectful of how he kicked it in. Just to, just because he was meeting with both sides or, or yada, yada, you know what I'm saying? That'd be like Moses, <laughs> you know, uh, meeting with the Pharaoh, you know, trying to negotiate with the Pharaoh just because he's trying to make negotiations don't mean he's weak or he's trying to accommodate, let him know. Of course, Moshe is like, look, man, let my people go. If you do that, you'll get your life, you know, and you know, possibly have some life, you know what I'm saying? But if you don't, here comes the plagues. We're going to talk some more about the Ice Age and the plagues that happened because this little Ice Age really was a worldwide plague, man. And it wasn't just America because it appears that Hawaii was, you know, um, you know, showing the pain, you know what I'm saying, with this cold front, this coldest time in over a thousand years hit America. Virginia cold. It was colder here than in Europe when they came over here. They didn't get no sunny paradise. But even over there, Africa, even in Antarctica, they were feeling the, the direct effect of this global or worldwide freeze over. Even if they try to downplay it, nah, man, it's an ice age. It's glaciation, right? We've been talking glaciation lines in America get the last drop. So Brent really popped off his version of this pan-tribal unity. But it proved unsuccessful, but Tecumse took up the flow. In more recent time, Brandt, Brandt's legacy has received debate due to his use of slave labor. Interesting, okay. Once African slavery was introduced, uh-oh. <laughs> African slavery, right. Let's go. Introduced into North America by European settlers, some Iroquois such as Brandt did own African slaves. Yeah, we don't know the details, you know. Which, you know, which tribes and what we're talking about. But we know that Israel had slaves. And, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Even uh, Isaiah 11 said you're going to take those into captivity whose captives you were. So that wouldn't be crazy to, to, you know, have another tribe in captivity whose captives we once were. You know, we don't know the details of the slavery, man. But. We are just talking to Coombs. <laughs> Let's get to tech and really kind of show you how this is connecting a little bit. The 
Kum se. Kum means to rise. Let's go. Uh, oh yeah, it's gonna give us some good drive. Let's just just got saw a brand down here. After the American Revolutionary War ended in 1783, the United States claimed the lands north of the Ohio River by right of conquest. Britain had renounced its claims to the area in the Treaty of Paris. So you got France all over here. They call it in this area New France. They make the Treaty of Paris, which pretty much stalled out the butt whipping they was getting from Dragon Canoe and the Chicamagua. Oh, representatives of King George III and Great Britain, representatives of the United States, please stop whipping us. Please stop whipping us is what they say. In response, Indians convened a great intertribal conference at Lower Sandusky in the summer of 1783. Speakers, most notably James, or excuse me, Joseph Brett, argued that Indians must unite to hold on to their land. So hold up. <laughs> so at this great intertribal conference, right, he's tribing up to his best ability the way he sees the future and how things are going and, you know, how we can bring them together and bring us together. He ain't saying everyone, you know, don't unite. He's saying you got to unite to hold on to your land. He's not in favor of giving up the Indian land, the Naga land. I think that's a big point with Brandt. He was representing at least the unity and the fact that you got to fight for your land. Hold on to your land. They put forth the doctrine that Indian lands were held in common by all tribes. So no further land should be ceded to the United States without consent of all the tribes. So the Treaty of Fort Wayne, that was the issue. 30 million acres of land. Without the permission of all the tribes, it's asinine, it's cray-cray, it's disrespectful. 30 million acres of land. 30 million joy worlds, man. <laughs> We're building a fence on one acre, my night. 30 million joy worlds you just gonna give them up 30 million without everyone's consent come on the coon say in a later speech he said look we don't even have the right to sell our land it's hawa given we can't sell what hawa gave us y'all that want to sell it y'all ain't connected to this like that maybe you don't connect to the creator maybe this ain't your lot by birthright so you want to fake like you are this Cherokee Confederacy <laughs> able to sell our land. Joseph Brown wasn't having that. He argued that Indians must unite to hold on to their lands. And they put forth the doctrine that Indian lands were held in common by all tribes. That's like us putting all our Nagaville together, you know, for those in the position right now to own land and we put it all together and we say Yo, all this is in common none of us have the right to sell any of it unless we all want to sell Nagaville we keep it Nagaville but we must all want to sell Nagaville you know what I'm saying so no further land should be ceded to the United States without consent of all the tribes this idea made a strong impression on Tecumse, just 15 years old when he attended the conference. So he was a little homie at the time that, that uh, you know, Mohawk was popping off, Joseph Brandt was popping off. He was just 15, over there soaking up gang, like, all right, how's this going to work? And, you know, what am I going to do? As an adult, he would become such a well-known advocate of this policy that some mistakenly thought it had originated with him, but he was soaking it up. The United States, however, insisted on dealing with the tribes individually, <laughs> getting each to sign separate land treaties, man. They're afraid of our unity, my nigga. 
So they said, now nah, we'll rather go to the separate Nagavilles and, you know, if we can get them off of, you know, Joy World and then get them off of <laughs> Nappy Goat Farm. And, and then we got two, you know, they, they don't want it to be a collective united decision. It's divide and conquer, right? Getting each to sign separate land treaties in January 1786, Malonta. Civil Chief of the Bekoki Shawnee Division signed the Treaty of Fort Finney, surrendering most of Ohio. God, gosh, man. So Fort Wayne was 1809. Treaty of Fort Finney was 1785. Whoa. So just like the Fort Wayne Treaty popped off, everything popping off, and you know, this 1811-1812 Tecumseh War, two years earlier, 1809, is when they gave up 30 million acres in the Treaty of Fort Wayne. It's like the same thing happened with the Treaty of Fort Finney. It was one year before it all started happening, 1780, or, you know, Sherlock, 17, I think. 76, 1775 or 1776 is when the Chicago War popped off. So this is, I guess, a couple years after the Treaty of Paris. All right, there we go. Now we got it. So they have this little break in action. <laughs> then comes the Treaty of Fort Finney, and then it's on and popping again. I mean, you remember what it's looking like. Seventeen eighty five, they said, right? So that's right here. So they, you know, about ten years into the war, the Treaty of Paris is right here, seventeen eighty three. It says the end of the American Revolutionary War, but it wasn't the end of the Chicago War. So this is the demarcation period where. You know, maybe certain of the tribes that started out fighting stopped fighting right about here. But the Shikamagua never stopped fighting. No major war, quasi war, all this is Indian war. Barbary War. We're just talking about the Knights, Manaka, which is the Shikamam. Same war, the Kumse's War. Here's where the Treaty of Fort Wayne was done. They have a break in the action with the Treaty of Paris. Here comes Fort Finney. <laughs> and it don't stop. It don't stop. Wow. surrendering most of Ohio. Later that year, Malunta was murdered by a Kentucky militiaman initiating a new border war. And we know that these Kentuckys were heavily infiltrated. I think about 10,000 Ishmaelites were migrating into Kentucky at this time. So remember that. Tecumseh, now about 18 years old, became a warrior under the tutelage of his older brother, Chisekau, Chesekau, who emerged as a noted war chief. Tecumseh participated in attacks on flatboats traveling down the Ohio River, carrying waves of immigrants into the lands the Shawnees had lost. They said, nah, you ain't coming in here. Nah, you ain't gonna settle here. He was disturbed by the sight of prisoners being cruelly treated by the Shawnees. An early indication of his lifelong aversion to torture and cruelty for which he would later be celebrated. In 1788, Tecumseh, Chesakau, and their family moved westward, re relocating near Cape Geraldo, Missouri. They hoped to be free of American settlers only to find colonists moving there as well. This parasite is everywhere. 
This parasite is affecting the whole earth body. Takum say would be like the white blood cells fighting the infection. <laughs> Except, you know, white means pure, right? <laughs> White's a tricky word. I mean, I guess white uh, can also refer to. Original inhabitants of Europe or North Africa. Right. White. <laughs> Yeah, buddy. So when they're referring to white, they're not just talking about complexion. They're talking about North Africa, Morocco, right? They're white. You see the census, 90-something percent white. Don't just think white. <laughs> Think white, you know what I'm saying? Think white, man. Wow, okay, let's go. Let's go. <laughs> let's go back for a second, man. Joseph Brand, right? So he's popping off. <laughs> There's this connection with this uh, Indian school. And there's so many treaties my knockers got to dig on, man. In August and September, he was present at Unity meetings in, in Detroit. Shout out to my Detroit knockers. And on September 7th at Lower Sandusky, Ohio, was a principal speaker at an Indian council attended by the Wyandots, Lenape, Shawnee, Cherokee, Ojibwa, Ottawa, and the Mingo. The Iroquois and 29 other Indian nations agreed to defend the 1768 Fort Stanwith, Fort Stanwich Treaty signed between representatives of the Iroquois and Great Britain in 1768. It was negotiated between Sir William Johnson, his deputy George Crogon, and representatives of the Iroquois. The Fort Stanwyck Treaty boundary line with European settlers by denying any Indian nation the ability to cede any land without common consent of all. So this was their solution, like no more land, man. Can't give up no more land because y'all scared, man. Without common consent, everybody, no. We got to either stand and fight or do something, man. Some gotta happen. Now. You know, this is a psychological warfare when you're digging on this more Indian charity school again. And you're gonna see how it connects more and more, more and more, man. I mean, Dartmouth. Hey, you even got Harvard Indian College, man. Institution established 1640s in order to educate Native American students at Harvard College. Yeah, it's, it seems to be this Indian school connection with all these Ivy Leagues, man. I mean, you know, you go ahead and start digging on it, you know, bit by bit, but not just them, you know what I mean? It's, it seems to be the foundation of education in America, mainly to indoctrinate you, my naga, first. Now they try to make, oh, well, you know, we want more Europeans here, or more Asians in these schools, or more this and more that, but 
that's a more and more war, my Naga. They really want you. They they want the brightest Nagas <laughs> that go to these schools. They want to pretend that they're white schools now, right? White schools. <laughs> but they are white schools, man. Right. Harvard. In reality, they want the brightest minds, the brightest Naga minds, because if they get you, then you're not trying to raise no, no gripe with them. You know, you if they get you <laughs> to be a missionary for their mission, to have your careers, just like uh football players and basketball, whoever, you know, it's like they they get our best athletes that would normally be the protectors, these big, strong, tall, big Nagas are supposed to be on the front lines fighting these hijacks for the tribe, you know what I'm saying? Protecting mothers and children and protecting their villages. Instead, they're getting millions of dollars, living in penthouses, chasing women around the world. They ain't worried about the struggle. <laughs> they worried about separating themselves, getting away from y'all. Divide and conquer. Get the brightest minds. Get the biggest, strongest athletes. Put them into our mission. Because it's not just about making you Christians for the mission. The mission, my naga, is to get you docile. To get you to not care, man. To put you in the mind of High Jack City. Yeah, I mean. From cas.umt.edu, <laughs> American Indians higher education before 1974 from coloniz colonization to self determination by David R. M. Beck. You know, really breaks down these Indians and you know how they're being affected by these Indian schools. It's kind of interesting. It says although. Let's get it bigger. Europeans and Americans evolved American Indians in their educational systems almost from first contact. It was only in the 19th and 20th centuries that the United States government made a full scale assault and took control of virtually all aspects of American Indian education with the purpose of forcing or encouraging assimilation. So before they said, oh, you know, Moore's Indian School. Our purpose is to provide education for Native Americans who desire to be missionaries to the Native tribes. They didn't say forced here. They said desire, right? But you know how these, <laughs> you know how the Moors and language can be, you know. You have to look deeper into what desire we're talking about. Whose desire we're talking about? Yeah. With the purpose of forcing or, or encouraging assimilation. Missionaries, right? To be missionaries to the native tribe. Assimilated, syncretinized, fused. Yeah. This assault, right? This is warfare to lie to these people, these children, you know, to take their, their mind bones away. So this assault began with treaty-based support for education in government schools run by both federally higher school teachers and missionaries paid for directly with the money the tribes received for their land. Wow. <laughs> wow. So the money they got for selling their land, somehow, based on these treaties, went back into these schools that will indoctrinate them to put them in a European mind frame, mind bone. 
the money they got for their lands is now going into the assault on their minds and their spirituality. They use that money to fund the psychological war, the spiritual war. They don't get their land back and they got to use that money for more devastation, assimilation. By the late 19th century, the federal government recognized the failure of day schools in the assimilation process, turned to the use of boarding schools on reservations and all through which Indians were trained in vocational and domestic skills and which were intended to, sev to sever children's ties to their cultures. That's the purpose, my life. I can't say no better than this. The purpose of these Indian schools is to sever you from your culture, from your mind, from your spirituality. They give you their JC. They give you a new God. They're separating you from Hawaii. You ain't going to Hawaii first. You praying in the name of JC. Oh, praise JC. Wow. You didn't do that before this hijack, man. It's a more and more war, can't you see? They're helping all this. These treaties are helping all this. They setting up shop on your head bone. Migrating, <laughs> doing laps around their queue. Taking over Indiana and India Superior and Indianapolis. The capital of the Indians. Their goal. Was to domesticate. You wild knockers. Their goal was to sever your ties. Your children's ties to the culture. During this time, few Indians were educated at a college level. The English and later Americans expected, expected those who were educated to use their education to help in the assimilation process. Bang. <laughs> yeah. To provide education for Native Americans who desire to be missionaries to the Native tribes. Please help us educate, quote unquote. The rest of you, Nagas, please help us civilize you. We're missionaries, but we need your magic to get through to the rest of the people. If you're good to us, they'll be good to us. Wow. I mean, right in our face bone, they're using us like they've been using us, man. Right in our face bone. Moore's Indian Charity School. <laughs> Can't believe it, man. This is Dartmouth, man. This is Dartmouth, man. We're just talking about education. Which were intended to sever children's ties to their cultures. My now, you know how important that is for them to sever your ties. Your culture is everything. Your land, your power, your medicine. During this time, few Indians were educated at college levels. All right, so these educational systems, while disrupting reservational life and culture, focus almost exclusively on industrial and domestic non-intellectual training. The quality of education provided was so low that even Indian students wishing to attend college were often academically ineligible for entrance. Not into the 60s and 70s when Indian communities were finally able to begin the arduous process of retaking control of their educational systems and institutions from the grade school through college levels. That situation began to seem at all promising from the preschool and grade level, grade school levels to the founding of the tribal community colleges. and private Indian-run colleges, such as NAES College. 
there were the beginnings of an attempt to infuse tribal cultural, infuse tribal cultural knowledge into teaching and learning systems in ways to which Indian communities could adapt curriculum to their specific needs and ultimately control the standards for education. Got it. Got it, boss. Got it. You know, you 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 go ahead and dig on this uh, travesty here, man. Uh, this is an interesting piece right here. It says uh, Franklin, Benjamin Franklin's famous description of the 1744 reply of six nations chiefs to the offer made by Virginia representatives to educate Indian children <laughs> reflects Indian understanding of the value of European higher education system. So before we talk colleges and Ivy League colleges and Harvard Indian schools and Dartmouth Moore Indian schools, here is a reply from these six nation chiefs to these Virginia representatives that wanted to educate their little knocks. <laughs> oh, you want to educate our children? Here's our reply. Here's what we think about your European higher education systems, because it seems to be at our detriment. It seems to include no value to tribing us up and kicking you off this land. Because if we ain't kicking you off this land, what are we doing? Making deals and deals and treaties and treaties. Giving up more land, more land. Fear, fear, fear. Here's what they had to say about the Indian or the European higher education. Several of our young people were formerly brought up at the colleges of Northern provinces. They were instructed in all your science. But when they came back to us, <laughs> they were bad runners, ignorant of every means of living in the woods, unable to bury their cold or hunger. You made us weak, man. I mean, all praise the Wah, you know, that we can start forming our communities and learning how to live, you know, off the grid a little bit and learning how to, you know, get ourselves back into, you know, that dragon shape that we're supposed to be in, but going after their schools and shut our culture off and made us go after their culture, man. Look what happened to the culture. Are you cultivating? Or do they say you in a cult? Oh, you must be in a cult now because you care about your culture, your actual culture. You care about keeping the cold of Hawaii. You must be in a cult, huh? Oh, oh you're doing agriculture? Agriculture? Y'all not just talking about doing your own agriculture? You must be in a cult, dog. Talking about culture. They took your culture away. You came back. The tribal chief said, look, man, several of our young little Nagas, <laughs> you know, went to your colleges and they came back to us. They couldn't run, man. They couldn't run, man. Just think about it. They couldn't, they couldn't run like they used to run. They're ignorant of every means of living in the woods. They have no ability to survive, man. You took their survival away. They're unable to bury the cold or hunger. Neither knew neither how to build a cabin. <laughs> Basic stuff that we learn in Joy World right now. <laughs> how to build, you know, little sheds, right? Cabins. Take a deer or kill an enemy. They forgot how to kill enemies. They're not trained to kill an enemy no more. They think the enemy is their friend. They're in amity with enemies. They spoke our language imperfectly. It's not even pure water no more. They're neither fit for hunters, warriors, or counselors. We can't do nothing with these little noggins after you teach them in your high education systems. 
your European high society systems bring our little nagas back useless. They were totally good for nothing. But the European mind says, what? You got a certificate. You could work a job. You could have this career. What's a career without your land, boss? What's all your monies without your tribe, boss? What happened to your tribe? Oh, they got massacred. Oh, God. But you got dollars. You drive a Benzo. You got a condo. You got a mansion. You play for this team. You play for that team. Good for nothing. Because to the tribe, yeah, you know, you could run a football, but can you run? You know what I'm saying? Can you run? Can you really run? I mean, yeah, you know, you you know all the mathematical equations, but uh, can you survive the cold? Can you survive hunger? Can you live in the woods? Can can we counsel you? I mean, can you counsel others in your ways and your culture? Are you a warrior? Can you kill the enemy? Damn, you can't. Well, you're totally good for nothing, boss. We are, however, not the less obliged to your kind offer, though we decline accepting it. And to show our grateful sense of it, if the gentlemen of Virginia will send us a dozen of their sons. Uh-oh. I like this talk. This is the talk we need to be talking. Why are you educating us? You're learning from us. You wrote fables about us, our priesthood, our prestors. Oh, you want to educate the descendants of Prester John? You want to share some education on how to be us? We can go to your colleges, get into all this debt, got to pay you back triple the amount that we borrow just to go work for the man. <laughs> Come on, man. Hey, we're declining your uh, stank ass offer. Matter of fact, why don't you send us a dozen of your sons? We will take great care of their education. Instruct them in all we know and make them make men of them. Whoa. <laughs> in your face, in your face, ball. I love that speech, man. That's in the Senate report, 1969, page 140. So no play play. We'll educate your boys and we're going to make men out of them. How about that? They're going to learn how to <laughs> live in the woods, man. They're going to learn how to take care of themselves and the damn sure going to learn who the enemy is. Oh, you don't want that? So why would we want your stank ass education? Man? I like this talk because now we just care about Brown University. Oh, my daughter's getting into Columbia. Yeah, she's going to be a doctor. As much of a doctor as they're going to teach you to become and all the oaths you got to take just to become a doctor. You still don't know how to save a life. Not in the woods, you don't. You don't know how to, you know, make your own elixirs and medicines and all that stuff. You don't know how to truly be a medicine man, right? A medicine woman, right? Princeton, yeah, my son went to Princeton, yeah. Ivy League, Ivy League. Indian school, Indian school, Indian school to hijack the Naga's mind bone so they can come back home worthless, good for nothing, boss. Totally good for nothing is what their higher education system is. European higher education system. I know my Naga's, you know, we think we got to send our children to these colleges to get educated, to get a job. Man, buy them some land and watch them pop off, man. We learn to educate ourselves again, to be bosses, to run businesses, to be supported by our own community. And we learn we don't need that much. 
We don't need a million, kajillion, kajillion of their paper fiat monies. We need to tap in to our inheritance. That's that ancient love song. You already rich, my nugget. <laughs> you just figuring it out. This is your land. This is your land. The Kumse is trying to tell a nugget. Right, shiny chief. Formerly a Native American confederacy promoting intertribal unity. We ain't heard that in a minute because these tribes today ain't trying to unify with us. Copper color cons found here. They want to take our titles. They want to paint their images on the Kumse. So they could say, hey, hey, that's me. You can't take them off of this. They proud of this. We are the sons and daughters of Tecumseh. Yeah, based on this sketch, right? Tecumseh was in the middle of a more and more war. Even though his efforts to unite Native Americans ended with his death in the War of 1812, he became an iconic folk hero in American, Indigenous, and Canadian popular history. All this he had to go through just to get to the point, you know, of checking all these tribes for all these treaties, you know, being born in Ohio at a time when the far-flung Shawnees were reuniting in their Ohio country homeland during his childhood. The Shawnees lost territory to the expanding American colonies in a series of border conflicts. The Kumse's father was killed in a battle against American colonists in 1774. Tecumse was therefore mentored by his older brother, Chesek Kao, noted war chief who died fighting in 1792. So what can he do? His dad died fighting. His brothers died fighting. What do you think Tech's going to do? You, th you think he's just over there just kicking it with the British and yada, yada? <laughs> Man, you, you, you over here slipping. We ain't seen this type of energy, man, since since Tupac, man. Yeah, for real, for real. I mean, that's the kind of energy Takuma says bringing. That's why they had to shut that down. He's talking about uniting the jails and uniting all Nagas under, you know what I'm saying, thug life, man. That's Takuma say, man. <laughs> I'm talking about Tupac attack, man. Takuma say joined Shawnee Chief Blue Jackets arm struggle against further American encroach encroachment. So he started rocking with Blue Jacket. Or Wei Ya Pier Sinwa. Yeah, war chief of the Shawnee. Preeminent Indian leader in the Northwest Indian War. So he was leading the Northwest Indian War. Wow. Because that's... Uh, that's all we talk about, right? Right? Whoa. And this is primarily popping off after their Treaty of Paris situation and Fort Finney situation where they're giving up damn near all of Ohio, right? Their homeland. They said, nah, we ain't going to do this no more. And then they did it again in 1809, gave away 30 million acres of land. The Kumse said, we ain't going to do this no more. <laughs> We're going to war for this. We ain't giving up no more land. Now I'm not going to try to buy land. Why are you buying land? I don't get it. So you don't understand any of these wars, man. But my 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 real Nagas, you know what I'm saying? They, they understand a Naga, you know, what it means to put our Naga field flag up. We represent for the Sheikh Mob. For all the indigenous Nagas. Today, whether you are a descendant of this side or that side, whether you are a descendant of the Chickasaw or the Shawnee or the Choctaw or the Delaware, 
I'm not going to we in this together. I think maybe they didn't see clear that the war couldn't have been avoided. You know, they had to try up there or they leave it to you today, right? If they would have known what they were leaving to you today, I guarantee the Kumsay would have had much more support, man. But today we have a chance to make a difference. And us digging on this is not to point the finger or put the blame on no tribes, but to say that we got to tribe up. And our mission to tribe up is the same as Joseph Brandt, the, the three councils, the Kumsay, and of course, what we're talking about here, the inter-tribal tribe up, uh, unity under Blue Jacket. So the Kumsay joined Blue Jacket against the High Jack. <clears throat> Shalak, let's get it. When ended, which ended in defeat at the Battle of Fallen Timbers, night 1794. So whatever this defeat is, you know, you see that there is a demarcation is that is suddenly no major war and suddenly this. So this whole roundup, you know, all this stuff was brewing just to pop back up with the Tecumseh War. From that point, we on and popping. <laughs> on and popping, Managa, when were you a slave? They say slaves were brought here to 1600s, Managa. And what was the slave doing during all this war? You thought it was just some white people war, American Revolutionary War, white British and white, uh, you know, American Anglos. The whole entire war, whatever war they call it, Philippine War, <laughs> Mexico War, all this is still you, banana wars, even the Vietnam. Or not. My dad was in Vietnam. You know, he was a musician. He had to play taps. Every time his, you know, homie died or someone died, he, he was playing at home. He played it so well, they kept him off the, you know, front lines of battle just so he can play his horn. His horn saved his life. And without his trumpet, I probably wouldn't be here today. My father was put in Vietnam by his mother. This is how crazy my family is, man. <laughs> my grandma signed my dad to war. She didn't want him playing his jazz music. He couldn't play jazz in the church. My dad was supposed to go to the Olympics as a hurdler or long jump, you know, doing track and field. He had to go to Vietnam because his mama said so. This is how they done her mind ball. It wasn't her fault. It's just how she was brought up. Poison in the mind. This is what led up to the poison. All this. When were you a slave, my nugget? This is the press the hour. To the Battle of Fallen Timbers, a lot of Nagas fell. The final battle in the Northwestern Indian War, a struggle between Native American tribes affiliated with the Western Confederacy and their British allies. They are confederate against you, right? Psalms 83. And with the loss of most of Ohio, then there's the Trini, Treaty of Greenville. Say we're going to look at these treaties a little closer. <laughs> 
formally titled treaty with the Wyandots, Wyandots, 1795 treaty between United States and indigenous nations of Northwest Territory, including the Wyandots and the Delaware. Here come the Delaware back in the equation. They've been making treaties. It was a sign of Fort Greenville, now Greenville, Ohio, on August 3rd, 1795. Play back it up. So this treaty refined the boundary between the indigenous people's lands and the territory for European American community settlement. They just wanted to settle, settle, settle. Invade, invade, invade. It was signed at Fort Greenville, now Greenville, Ohio, August 3rd, 1795, following the Native American loss at the Battle of Fallen Timbers a year earlier ended with the Northwest Indian War and the Ohio country limited Indian country to Northwest Ohio and began the practice of annual payments following the land concessions. Damn, here come the taxes. <laughs> here come the tax. The parties to the treaty were a coalition of Native American tribes known as the Western Confederacy and United States government presented by General Anthony Wayne. What's got to do with the Treaty of Fort Wayne, my nigga? And local frontiersmen. Treaties. 1805, the Kumsay's younger brother, Ten Skawatawa who came to be known as the Shawnee Prophet, founded a religious movement. Oh, he's talking about keeping the code that called upon Native Americans to reject European influences and return to a more traditional lifestyle. They didn't want them Indian schools. 1808, the Kumsay and Tenska Watawa established Prophet's Town, a village in present-day Indiana that grew into a large multi-tribal community. Nothing we doing is new. Tribing up ain't new. It's just a matter of us coming together with one consent, man. We ain't got to talk reckless. We ain't got to be reckless. We can say, hey, let's keep the code of Hawaii. And in that code, you're going to see the magic shift in your favor, man. You're going to see the spells get broken because you're listening again. You're hearkening to Hawa. You're putting the creator first. And with that, you can make your battle cry because you got Hawa fighting with you and can't no one stand up. <laughs> can't no one stand up to the creator. Without our creator, we die like men. With our creator, we rise like cons. Kumse traveled constantly speaking the prophet's message and eclipsing his brother in prominence. Kumse proclaimed that Native Americans owned their lands in common and urged tribes not to cede more territory unless all agree. His message, his message alarmed American leaders, of course, right? He's talking to unity, as well as Native leaders who sought accommodation with the United States. We're going to talk some more of this uh, push mataha and these accommodations. And again, ain't about, you know, hurting nobody's feelings about it. You know, it's just like I and we can understand how any tribal leader or chief has to protect his tribe. But we can now also see with wisdom the errors of our ancestors' ways. We can't defend this shit no more. You could say, yeah, give up all our land. That's going to make our people live, right? No, it's going to be a slow death. They're going to lose their identity. Oh, let's sign these treaties and let's pretend, you know, that, uh, you know, that we had nothing to do with it. <laughs> but Hawaii knows and you're going to get that work. 
based on what you've done to the children of Asherah, the children of Israel. You're going to get that work. It's just what it is. We had to get this work. We had to get our work. You're going to have to get your work. We can't save you. We're not your savior. But you can save yourselves. Code up. Tribe up. Put yourself in the best position <laughs> to uh, answer to Hawa. You know what I'm saying? That's, that's all you got. One shot to put yourselves in the best position because you've been accommodating the United States Corporation. It's time for you to accommodate the code. That's your only solution. Your only hope. In 1811, when Tecumseh was in the South recruiting allies, Americans under William Henry Harris defeated 10 Skawatawa at the Battle of Tippecanoe and destroyed Prophet's Town. So last time we got that Tecumseh was away gathering the tribe, rallying the tribes, and that's when they attacked Prophet's Town. When Tecumseh was away, divide and conquer. In the War of 1812, Tecumseh joined his cause with the British recruited warriors, warriors and helped capture Detroit in August 1812. The following year, he led an unsuccessful campaign against the United States in Ohio and Indiana. And again, just <clears throat> for clarity purposes, we're about to get this document, you know, that's really anti Tecumseh. They try to be like, oh, well, what war has he won? You know, yada, yada. Well, clearly he put his influence up and, you know, not only tribed up who he could tribe up, because again, if everybody ain't tribing up, you can't get mad at Tecumseh for not ultimately winning the war. You can't point the figure, well, what war has he won? What war did you help him win? And he should have been fighting as hard as he had to fight. If you didn't tribe up, if the other confederacies didn't tribe up with the devil, right? The adversary, huh? When U.S. naval forces took control of Lake Erie in 1813, Tecumseh reluctantly retreated with the British into Upper Canada. And this is when he fought his last battle, the Battle of Thames, on October 5th, 1813, in which Tecumseh was killed. And the loss of uh, the powerful Tecumseh caused the collapse of, you know, much of the work. You know, his, his brother had been killed in the Battle of Tippecanoe. He lost his other brother. He lost his father, you know. He was killed. I mean, that was the hardball, you know what I'm saying? The Siege of Detroit was also known as the Surrender of Detroit or the Battle of Fort Detroit. Early engagement in the British-U.S. War of 1812, a British force under Major General Isaac Brook or Brock with Native American allies under Shawnee leader Tecumseh used bluff and deception to intimidate. All right, so yeah, they, they popped off. So it appears that he, he did help, you know, win whatever skirmish that was. But, you know, the, the final battle, <laughs> It's 500 Nagas versus 5,000, man. What do you want from the, from the big bro to come say? You know, it could have been 5,000 on 5,000 if it wasn't for these treaties, which is why we got to do this because we lost Nagas, man, because of this. So I'm not going hard enough on these, you know, treacherous, you know what I'm saying, ox, treacherous brothers, treacherous, you know, family that went against the unity. I'm not going hard enough. Y'all getting off easy, but you ain't going to get off. I'm here to tell you, you ain't going to get away from this. You feel this in your heart bone. The script says when we wake up and see what happens, it's going to be weeping. It's going to be mourning. You feel it already. We had to bring it to the 1800s. Because in chronology, they pushed time back 1800 years. So that the Kumse War Imagine if they pushed that back 1,800 years and you're reading about it in history at 
at year one. <laughs> you're, you're at year one. But it happened in 1813. You know, you're in the, in the 200s, 300s, you know, talking about a, a king or a prophet or, you know, a chief or whatever. You're not knowing that this took place in the 1800s. I know. And even when I tell you, you're still going to be like, nah, that was in the BCs. Why? Because they say so. They added 1,800 years in some instances to your timeline. 1,000 years, 300 years, whatever. Time shifts. The lands he fought to defend were eventually given to the U.S. So all that death for nothing. He went all or nothing, man. Balls to the wall. Either we win or we lose everything. Either way, we're going to lose it all. You know, if we don't fight, we're going to lose it all for sure. Or we're going to leave it to our children in 2022 to try to figure this out. He said, I'm going to make my stand here. I'm not going to wait for my great, 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 great grandchildren to put this together, to, to get these 500 noggins together. We got 500 noggins. We going up, man. Let's go. That's how we feel today. You want to wait and, and, and make the issue be on your grandchildren and your children? When you know better today, you got to hope that that what you pass on to them, you know, in this metaverse is, is going to stick, man. We have to make our rise. I believe we're doing it the right way by purifying ourselves so that our creator can hear us again. Give us the wisdom, Amah Abba, to proceed. That won't cause unnecessary, unnatural death and demise of our people, but will bring life to our people. We don't know the battlefield like the Kumse knew it. We don't know life in the woods like the Shawnee knew it. But perhaps we can know the cold more than anyone, any one of our ancestors ever knew it. Just like a say, it's going to be written in a heart bone. We can be on cold more than all of our ancestors were ever on cold. And in this, we can secure our lands because Hawa will secure it for us as he did with Moshe and the Exodus and Joshua and Kandawi. We solidify our force field again. We cannot be touched and we cannot be faded. And one Naga will again be able to go against 10,000 hijacks. 20 Nagas against 20 million on our Zechariah flow. Love to come fresh. Go. <laughs> His legacy was one of the most celebrated Native Americans in history grew. In the years after his death, although details of his life have often been obscured by mythologies. Amen. So much to dig on. With Kunse, with Joseph Brand, the Mohawk, the Shikamagua. Seventeen eighty nine, seventeen ninety, the Kunse traveled south to with Chesakau to live with the Shikamagua near Lookout Point. So he was brought into this. His brother brought him in. His dad was already fighting. He was already going up. Some Shawnees already lived among the Shikamagua, who were fierce opponents of U.S. expansion. And this is what it is. You can't have it, you can't have it no other way. Either you're a fierce opponent of the hijack, or you're going to turn into the hijack slowly, but for sure. If not you, your children, your children's children. Jessica led about 40 Shawnees in raids against the colonies. The Kumse was presumably among them during his nearly two years among the Shikamawa. The Kumse probably had a daughter with a Cherokee woman. The result, the relationship was brief. The child remained with her mother. They're at war. They don't have time to be raising no family. 
yeah, he's like, hey, take take the baby, keep him safe. It wasn't like he didn't want to kick it with the mama. <laughs> he's like, yo, hide the child. If anything, that's my child. Hide her. Go into hiding. <laughs> I'm at war with these motherfuckers. So, you know, he had been with the Shikamago two years by then. This is why I said all these Shikamago wars, the Kumsei's in it. He's a he's a teenager. His brothers are in it. His pops had, had already passed before they started their timeline of wars. The war was already going in in the early 17s. This wasn't the first time Nagas was fighting back. We've been fighting the whole time, I'm not gonna, that's why I said, when did you, why do you believe you were brought from Africa on a slave ship and been in captivity on some plantation for hundreds of years with some Negro revolts here and there? <laughs> Here's your Negro revolts, my dog. It never stopped. It never stopped. It never stopped, man. You never stopped. I'm not gonna never stop fighting back. Treaty of Fort Wayne. I'm not gonna never stop fighting back. Negotiations primarily involve the Delaware trial. And what 10 years later, the Delaware get removed, the Miami get removed. Treaty's no good. This treaty gave up 29,719,530 acres of Native American land. This is after they gave up Ohio. Other notable treaties, you got the Treaty of St. Mary. Fort Wayne, obviously. And St. Mary. I believe this is when the Delaware and them were removed. Man, and look how much land was given up. Treaty of Tippecanoe, 1832. All this is after Tecumseh's death. Clark's Grant, Grousland, Vincennes, 1804. Greenville, 1795. Miss uh, Ninwa, something like that, 1826. Treaty of Chicago, 1821. So dig on some more of these treaties. You got the Treaty of Wabash, 1840. And that's getting more into that Wabash River. And we talked about these Kentuckians, man. And all these so-called volunteers coming out of Kentucky to fight against the Coombs saying that. Tribe of Ishmael migrating at the same damn time as these treaties and these wars is popping off, man. 1785, come on, man. Come on, man. You're just peacefully migrating. Is this, is this your story, man? Yeah. The Ben Ishmael tribe, it's your story out of Ohio. Treaties giving up all the land in Ohio. Ohio. Now you just popping off in the Ohio Valley. We're watching you real close. Sons of Ishmael. Confederacy. Oh, they got poor whites in their tribe. Interesting. They created a colony in Kentucky in 1790. So 1790, they're in Kentucky. <laughs> right? The Kentuckians is going to war now, volunteering, all these volunteers coming out of Kentucky. Crazy. Crazy talk. <laughs> the 
The War of 1812 left an indelible mark on our nation's history. Kentuckians played a vital role. So in the midst of things, they popping off, man. Setting up cities like Muhammad, Mecca, Morocco, and Cairo. Walking around their queue, 350-mile triangular migration route. Can't make this stuff up. Just makes you just shake your head. Makes you just walk around shaking your head all day. The Ishmael's light. The Ishmaelites disappeared from historical memory after the Indian laws for sterilization of feeble-minded and subhuman families went into effect in 1907. See, even when you make treaties, somehow the jam of just still comes back to you, man. Today, we don't know who's behind the veil, man, but I'm willing to bet they look something like us, you know? Glaciation lines, man. Come on, man. How are you going to have glaciation in America? Well, we talked last time about the Little Ice Age. So this freeze over is popping off around here. It's not nice to the hijack. It's not nice to nobody. Fort Wayne Moraine, Wabash. They're making Wabash treaties. No, I can't make this up. Glaciation, glaciers, glaciers. I mean, you, you got to think about this. This is Indiana, Illinois, Louisville, Kentucky. Come. Glaciation is the process, condition, or result of being covered by glaciers, my God. Or ice sheets. All right, let's say ice sheets. Okay. Limit of glaciation, approximate edge of glacial advance. So this is where the ice sheet is advancing. Ice sheet, man. Ice sheet. So when we talked about the, the little ice age, this ain't no play play. I mean, this is popping off approximately, right, between these 1300s. You know what I mean? Up into 1850. And some would say that even now we're still kind of getting out of the glaciation or, you know, ice age <laughs> type of thing. So during our captivity and during all this struggle we're having and during all this fighting and all this death, ice, 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 baby. <laughs> ice, ice, baby. Doom, 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 doom. White ice, vanilla ice, man. Ice. Ice in America, glaciers in America. Hawaii is plaguing the land now because of all this hijacking death. The Kumse died, ice is popping off. Dragon Canoe died, ice is popping off. Monogas is dying and the ice is piling up. Is this one the ice wall? was formed in Antarctica. I mean, it's an interesting theory because their theories of causality, several causes, sit. here's their number one thing. You know, uh, when they talk about the Ice Age, I got a small clip I'm gonna get for the dismount on this Ice Age, but they pretty much focus on the solar radiation and not a lot of solar 
cycle, whatever. And maybe this fuck word for word, they they kick this first, right? They only really focus on the volcanic activity, you know, causing global cooling. Yada yada. Lack of solar radiation, lack of the sun. We got to put it together. We're talking Europe, right? We're talking Europe, right? So we're talking Black pay, Plague, Black Death. The sun wasn't even coming out for them like that. You got Esteban in the cartoon series. They're begging for young Esteban to bring out the sun once a year. Like, bring out the sun today, please, Esteban. Let the sun come shining through. I said, wow, they really had no sun. They really were in darkness. And they came over here and they brought that bullshit over here. They were plagued over here like the same parasite was plagued over there. And the parasite, I'm saying it very, uh, that's the nicest way I could put it because you're going around spreading disease everywhere you go. But you don't want to talk about the disease. You don't want to talk about the black plague, but it's listed as one of the possible causes for this ice age. Ice age resulting in glaciation. Glaciation, which is the result of being covered by ice. Okay. All right. Put it together, man. Was it the solar radiation or was it the volcanic activity? Or maybe it was the changes in the ocean circulation. Or maybe it was the variations in the Earth's orbit and the tilting of the axis. <laughs> or maybe it was the inherent variability in global climate. Because inherently it's going to vary. Or maybe it was the decreases in the human population. Really, let's talk about it. Let's talk about the decreases in human population. Indian war, Indian war, Indian war. Texas Indian, Cherokee Indian, Seminole, Southwest Indian, Northwest Indian. Maybe it was that Hawa wasn't pleased with the decrease of his people. Maybe it was these, ep these epidemics, they call it, emerging in the Americas upon European contact. They didn't want to talk about this in the little video about the Ice Age that we're going to get for the dismount. They want to focus on that volcanic activity and solar radiation. They don't want to focus on European contact. Because then they have to say, damn, am I truly that much of a pestilence that I would bring so much death to the Americas that it would cause a mother sucking ice age? That Hawaii would curse this land to such a degree because I showed up here. That these epidemics are emerging out of European contact. What kind of European content? Texas war, Seminole war, 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 more and more. Managa, when I say European, <laughs> I mean, you know what Holy Roman Emperor Charles E. Boy looked like, man, right? The first uh, European emperor, uh, conqueror of the, of the Inca, right? He look like a regular Naga, right? He's a European, right? So I'm not saying white people as you know white people, right? <laughs> well, Naga, we talking glaciation white, right? <laughs> we talking North Africa white. Yeah. We're talking the more and more war. These tribes didn't come over here and get cozy. No. Nah, they didn't have a chance to come over here and get cozy, boss. In Europe, 
The Baltic Sea froze over twice in 1303 to 1307. Unseasonable cold storms, rains. The Little Ice Age brought colder winters to parts of Europe and North America. Farmers and villages in the Swiss Alps were destroyed by encroaching glaciers in the mid 17th century. Canals and rivers in Great Britain and the, ne the Netherlands were frequently frozen deeply enough to support ice skating and winter festivals. Everybody's feeling it. It's not just in America, but it seems to be hitting the hardest in America. Little Ice Age by anthropo anthropologist Brian Fagan of the University of California at Santa Barbara tells of the plight of European peasants. European peasants from 1300 to 1850. Famines, hypothermia, bread rice, they needed bread. And so this is all happening during all these riots, during the Indian Wars. Come on, man. <laughs> Put it together, my night. Seems like a curse to me. Seems like a plague, right? Famine, hypothermia, riots, rise of despotic leaders brutalizing and increasingly dispirited peasantry. Late 17th century agriculture had dropped off dramatically. Alpine villagers lived on bread made from ground nutshells mixed with barley and oat flour. Historian Wolfgang Beringer has linked intensive witch hunting episodes in Europe to agricultural failures. Whoa. He's linking the witch hunting going on in Europe to the agricultural failures. <laughs> what? The more witches you hunt, the more your crops ain't going to grow. Seems like a personal problem they got with Hawaii and who are these witches right they're calling Ten Sky Tawa to come saying them they're witches too because they possess this type of energy that they're not familiar with witch hunts lead to agricultural failures come on so this is a plague, right? For example, outbreaks of the plague were often blamed on Jews. Here goes the witch hunts. Jewish populations were murdered, but they don't talk about this with the Holocaust because they're talking 1300s and they know they ain't talking them. We're talking Hebrews, 1300. They're being murdered in an attempt to stop the plague. Body bag. So they know it's a plague. Who's plaguing them? Now you say, who's plague? Just a random plague? Or is this plague connected with European contact emerging in the Americas? No, you just want to talk volcano activity. Okay. But why wouldn't the dragons be popping off? Why wouldn't the dragons be popping off out that volcano? The first river Thames Frost Fair was in 1608 and the last 1814. So in some ways it's like, you know, we're just coming out of this freeze over. And we got last time that this threw off the early <laughs> colonizers, I guess so, who had expected climates in North America to be similar to that of Europe, however, historians agree it was one of the coldest time periods in the last 1,000 years. That's a long time to get the record of the coldest 1,000-year period. That's like saying, man, tomorrow's going to be the coldest it's been since the year 1022. That's hella cold. A thousand years, you're going to break a record? The largest drought 
of the past 800 years. No water. It's hella ice. So yeah, this ice age seems to have quite a bit to do with the glaciations. Literal glaciers in America during this time of your migration, man. You walking around your cube in the ice, man. <laughs> With your holy mountain of harmonics. Har <laughs> harmonics have anything to do with this free zone? Uh, you know, they, they bring up this Greenland ice sheet a lot. And, you know, we've seen, you know, this connectivity of Greenland, how we could pretty much walk to Greenland and, in the 1500 maps, I mean, was Greenland recently froze over? Is that like a tropical paradise as well? Like Antarctica was? Is it real snow? Is it fake snow? I mean, what's going on? <laughs> what's going on in Danville, man? <laughs> con, con. So, You know, the coon say it was known as an orator, you know, the press that knew how to speak, man. And his, his brother apparently had a stutter, they said. So, you know, he had to do most of the speeches, you know, but really the prophet, you know, his brother, you know what I'm saying, would be really known as, you know, I guess the, uh, the heart bone, you know what I'm saying, of the operation, but they worked, you know, side by side. Here's a speech he gave to Governor William Harris. So oh, here goes this Harris again. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, don't play with the links now. <laughs> William Henry Harris, principal chief of the Choctaw. Or are we talking President William Harris Sr.? There we go. Old typical new they call. And it's crazy how they be naming themselves after these places of death. You know what I'm saying? Where they put the prophet down, where they now they're gonna call themselves after typical new. Now his name is typical new. This jabroni over here is named William Tecumseh Sherman. He's named after Tecumseh, someone that he would be trying to kill. He's named after. Only the only the parasite, man, is about this total takeover. Take over your name, take your titles, take your land, because he don't got any. He don't got any by birth. Look at him. He don't have anything by birth. He's about complete takeover. Take your titles, <laughs> your name, your inheritance. So the coon say has a speech to this Harris. Brother, I wish you <laughs> listen carefully. As I do not think you understand what I so often have told you. Since the peace was made, you have killed some of the Shana walls. Shawanos, the Winnebago's. Delaware. Miami's have taken our lands. We cannot long remain at peace if you persist in doing these things. I mean, the Indians have resolved to unite to preserve their lands, but you try to prevent this by taking tribes aside and advising them not to join the Confederacy, the cons, the original Confederacy. The United States has set us an example by forming a union of their fires. We're going to get on the Council of Fires, the OG. We do not complain. Why then should you complain if the Indians do the same thing among their tribes? You buy land from the village chiefs. 
who have no right to sell. If you continue to buy lands from these petty chiefs, there will be trouble because they are petty chiefs. They ain't no big time, big dragons selling our land. You buy them from the petty chiefs and I cannot foretell the consequences. <laughs> ain't no play play to cool say. The land belongs to all the Indians. It cannot be sold without the consent of all. We intend to punish these village chiefs who have been false to us. It is true I am Shana all. But I speak for all the Indians, Wyandotes, Miamis, Delawares, Kickapoo, Ottawas, Potawatomis, Winnebago, Shana Oys. For the Indians of the lakes and for those whose hunting grounds lie along the Mississippi, even down to the Salt Sea, my forefathers were warriors. Their son is a warrior. From them, I take only my existence. From my tribe, I take nothing. I am the maker of my own fortune. Oh, could I but make the fortune of my red people as great as I conceive when I commune with the great spirit who rules the universe. He's going directly to Hawa. The voice within me communing with past ages tells me that once and not so long ago, there were no, <laughs> there were no white men on this continent not so long ago. No, oh, but now they say, oh, well, I'm part Cherokee. I'm part Choctaw. My descendants were such and such. Here they go, taking titles, finding a place to call. It then belonged to the red men who were placed there by the great spirit, Lawa, to enjoy it. Wait, they migrated from Africa. Is that what he said? Oh, you were placed here by Hawa. Both they and their children, now our once happy people are miserable, driven back by the white man, who are never contented, but always encroaching. The way, the only way to check this evil is for the red man, the copper color naga, because red is copper, to unite in claiming a common and equal right in the land as it was at first. Unite the tribes, claim a common and equal right in the land. As it was at first and, sh and should be yet, for it was the gift of the great spirit to us all talking inheritance man we talking inheritance and therefore the few cannot seed it away forever what sell a country <laughs> why not sell the air the clouds the great sea as well as the earth sell everything then man you're gonna sell a country backward have the americans driven us from the sea and on towards the setting sun are we being forced, neka to kushi, kata polinto, like a get, like a galloping horse. But now we will yield no further. But here make our stand, brother. I wish you would take pity on the red people and do what I have requested. The great spirit has inspired me, and I speak nothing but the truth to you. Sound like Moses talk. Let my people go. Sound like Moshe talk. Sound like Preston talk. Let my people go. One thing about the Preston, is he on the front lines for his Nagas? One thing about Moshe, he on the front lines for his Nagas. Dawi, front lines for his Nagas. Joshua, front lines for his Nagas. The Kumse front line for his Nagas. 
The great spirit has inspired me. Let's go. And this is a continuation of, you know, part of that speech, sell a country, why not sell the air? <laughs> the clouds, the great sea, as we, as well as the earth, did not the great spirit make them all for the use of his children? Brother, I was glad to hear what you told us. You said that if we should, could prove that the land was sold by people who had no right to sell it, you would restore it. I will prove. I will prove that those who did sell did not own it. Did they have a deed, a title? No, you say those prove someone owns lands. Those chiefs only spoke a claim. And so you pretended to believe their claim only because you wanted the land. But the many tribes with me will not agree with those claims. They will never they have never had a title to sell, and we agree this proves you could not buy it from them. If the land is not given back to us, you will see when we return to our home from here how it will be settled. It will be like this. We shall have a great council at which all the tribes will be present. We shall show to those who sold that they had no rights to claims they set up and we shall see what will be done to those chiefs who did sell the land to you. Is he lying? <laughs> what happened to those chiefs, man? I am not alone in this determination. It is the determination of all the warriors and red people who listen to me. Brother, I now wish you listen to me. If you do not wipe out that treaty, you're talking about Fort Wayne, man. We're talking about 30 million acres of land, man. If you don't wipe out that treaty, if you don't cut it out, man, it will seem that you wish to kill all the chiefs who sold the land. I tell you, <laughs> he ain't playing nan nutter, right? I tell you so because I'm authorized by all tribes to do so. Damn. If you don't give up this land back, if you don't get this land back, every chief that you did business with is going to die. And I'm authorized to do so. <laughs> I am the head of them all. Whoa. What's the Kumse talking about, right? We just got the Israel-Indian connection. Get the last drop. We're talking Israel, right? We're talking press the flow. He's letting them know. <laughs> I am the Khan. Just like Genghis Khan went up against his own brother, his own unk, his own uncle, the Preston, Dawi. So are these brothers, so are these Moors going at the head, forming confederacies and treaties on the head, because he is the head. This is why I push my ties, like, look, man, we don't got no monarch. We don't got no king. We ain't got no head. You ain't going to be head of us. You always want to be head of everything. And clearly that's where they, they differ, you see. He's the head based on appointment of the great spirit, right? He's the head based on the appointment of the hierarchy of the tribes that have order. Pushing them, they wanted a new order, a new world order. All my warriors will meet together with me in two or three moons from now. Then I will call for those chiefs who sold you this land and we shall know what to do with them. If you do not restore the land, you will have hand, you will have had a hand in killing them. <sighs> Heavy words from tech. 
Heavy words from Tech. The Kumse traveled south to recruit more allies. First, he met with Harrison, who reported that the Kumse wished everything to remain in its present situation until his return. Our settlement's not to progress further, although the Kumse continually proposed peace and refrained from attacking white settlements. Harrison's spies reported that the Kumse's followers were preparing for war. With the Kumse away, meeting with other native leaders, trying to tribe them up. Harrison decided to take advantage. His absence, Harrison noted, affords the most favorable opportunity for breaking up his Confederacy. Now, we got before that they acted like it was uh, uh, the prophet's fault, that he, you know, he, he egged them on with all these shows of power and all this witchcraft and all this stuff. In reality, they saw an opportunity and they took it. To break up his confederacy, his tribe. November 1811, Harrison's army marched to Prophetstown, the headquarters of the confederacy, although native warriors launched a surprise attack as Harrison's troops op approached, the soldiers fought back successfully and they burned the town. Surprise attack. Well, apparently, the prophet Tenskowatawa, he knew they was coming. So all this, oh, he egged us on, you know, he he uh he provoked this whole thing. Nah, you was already looking at the favorable opportunity <laughs> for breaking up his confederacy. He was ready and did the best he could, but he fell. When the Kumse came back, he concluded that any chance for peace with the white settlers had vanished. Uh, it was all the way up. With his remaining followers, he set out for Upper Canada. So he went from Indiana, shot up north, Right, Upper Canada. He planned to meet, you know, he wanted more allies, right? He needed the British officers and negotiate an alliance against the Americans by continuing to expand onto their lands repeatedly, revising treaty boundaries and finally by attacking them outright. White Americans had driven the native Confederacy to ally with the Brit British. So they were driven to make this alliance. This, this was the last you know, last ditch effort, man. And even that wasn't enough. Even though, you know, they changed the image of these indigenous Nagas, you know, I like this picture because you can see how shook Harrison and them were, right? <laughs> how shook they were coming up against big tech. Because anyone who don't give a damn no more, who truly don't give a fuck no more, who has no fear, it's the worst possible outcome for the hijack when you don't fear them at all. You know what I'm saying? When they don't have that fear factor, they know it's going to be a problem. I want the present boundary line to continue. Should you cross it, I assure you it will be productive of bad consequences. We're just talking about the big homie tech, man. And, you know, you know, you get different, you know, we're, we're piecing it together. So we're getting different versions of these speeches and, you know, Let's see, you know, hearing what different perspectives I had to say about the uniting of these tribes. Yeah, it don't it don't look like they were provoked. It looked like 
they almost set it up, you know. They knew where he was going. They waited till he left. He had to go to try to trap him up. And if he had it all to do again, he probably would have stayed right there in Prophet's, Prophet's town and just popped off. You already know it. He wouldn't have left his bro. They say the comb say means shooting star <laughs> or comet or media. And the media is the Presta and the Presta is the dragon. Who is the father of Hushi Yukpa? Happy bird. Who is the sister of Push Mataha? Over here it says, you know, she's the daughter of the sun mythical. That's all they give us in the moon mythical. You know, another link says that she's the daughter of Father Choctaw and Mother Choctaw. Born 1760 of the Choctaw people, Choctaw people. At the time, the lands were claimed by France, right? You got the Treaty of Paris, calling this Choctaw land New France. But it would become U.S. territory with the Louisiana Purchase, which only took place because of all these treaties. Hushiyukpa Chokta, born 1751. All right, so here it says 1760. Here it says 1751 in New France or Choctaw territory. Here it calls her father in Key <laughs> Choctaw. And he was 21 and her mother was Ish Ishki. So that's like father and mother, same thing since they don't really know their names because they don't have the records that say, but she married James Garland. And, you know, we got on them Garlands last time, you know what I mean? Really big and fighting the Nagas in the War of 1812. It's all coming back to 1812, the Kumsay's War. So Garland was fighting against the Kumsay, right? Fighting against the Shimanoe. Fighting against the Mexicans, fighting against the Udall, Judah. She's married to this hijack. Or she's married to James Garland. And John Garland's the son of James Garland. Got it. Okay. We're just putting this war together on both sides, man. Seeing who's who. I know. You see Inky. <laughs> You're like, Inky? Inky, like, you know, look, like Sumerian talk, Inky. I mean, it's spelled I-N-K-I, -I, but an interesting correlation. <laughs> she married James Garland in 1777 in New France. They were the parents of two sons. She died at 42. Inky, all right. Father Inky in Choctaw. So Inky is father. It's a title. So even in Samaria talk, Inky is father. Husband of mother Choctaw. Father of Nahom Demo Choctaw. Hush, Hushik Yukpa Choctaw and Push Mata. Talking father talk to mother talk to Inky and Ishki, right? Okay. <laughs> Inky is the usual Choctaw word for father. Other options are Anki, Chinki or Kenki, or Kanka. Uh -huh. Chin is not spelled or pronounced with the ch ch like Choctaw would really be 
Cocteau. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, man. Chin key would be Ken key or Khan key. Khan key, Khan key, Khan key, Khan ka key, Khan key, Khan ka, Khan ka key. Which was a major area of connection for not just the Choctaw, but all the Cherokee, all the tribes, man. All these Indianapolis is the capital of the Indian city. But not at this point over here, you see how it was hijacked into their harmonic mountain, Muhammad and Mecca and Morocco. Kinki, Khan. All right, I can't make this up. It could be Pinky, Tikba, the parents of Pushmataha, Hushayukpa, and Nahomatima were Choctaw born in the old Choctaw lands, literally around 1740. These lands passed between Spain and France during the 18th century before coming into the United States possession. In the 19th century, eventually becoming parts of the U.S. states of Mississippi and Alabama. Oral tradition that they were killed during a creek raid, Managa. So this beef between the Choctaw and the creek is an ancient beef. And as it goes back, as ancient as like the biblical tribes are, are going back and forth. Like Israel and Moab is going back a long ways. And, you know, it seems like these type of tribal beefs you know are paralleling you know a lot of these biblical tribal beefs right so we're talking about the migration of ishmael Khan, <laughs> on their village 1770 so you know push must have hated the creeks man because according to the oral tradition his parents were killed by the creeks right so he's not going to tribal with the comb say especially when the, the Kumse is fighting alongside of the Creeks and the Creeks killed his parents. So we're getting an understanding of the emotion on both sides. Due to their deaths occurring well before written records were kept in that society, their names were unknown. Also Choctaw Moors. <laughs> what? Body back for the illusion just dealt with the more Indian school and now we know we got a Choctaw more connection right we already knew that though we already knew but the Choctaw Moors held that the names of the dead were no longer spoken and thus pushed Mataha when asked what state he had no parents when pressed about his early years he would often tell the ruling tale the following tale Push my taha. Never had a father nor a mother. A little cloud once seen in the northern sky it came before a running, a rushing wind, and covered the Choctaw country with darkness. Out of it flew the angry fire. The angry fire. It struck a large oak and scattered its limbs and its trunk all along the ground. And from that spot sprung forth a warrior fully armed for war and that man was Pushmataha spoken by Pushmataha in response to John Calhoun Secretary of War 1824 yeah. <laughs> and like we got a piece of this before out this Indiana University Press the Kumse and Push Mataha, you know, they going back and forth. You know, we read some of the Kumse speech to Harrison. You know, these jabronis here, man, they they pretty much just skip over all of the Kumse speech and go right into the Push Mataha speech. But you know, you know, the author's gonna tell their side of things. We're just belly flopping in it on page five. 
Dr. Kumse was classed by many of his contemporaries as the most powerful debater of his generation. And this was saying much for it was during the day of Clay, Calhoun, and Webster. So we just got his, uh, or at least Push's response to Calhoun. You see all these characters coming to life here, realizing the full, full power of his oratory. The Kumse surmised if he could get to speak to the Choctaw people and the general council. They would not be able to resist his magnetic eloquence. He said, just put me before your people. Let me talk to him. So the council was assembled and Tecumse with his suite of 30 warriors bedecked in panoply of, panoply of paint and feathers filled in before the council fire to deliver his address. We must bear in mind that the Shawnee spoke an entirely different language from the Choctaw and Chickasaw. Chickasaw. The Shawnees belonging to the Algonquin stock. Got it, got it. While the Choctaw and Chickasaw were of the Muscogee stock and spoke Muscogee dialect, therefore it was necessary for each speech to be translated by an interpreter so all might understand. The great Shawnee chief was thoroughly familiar with past relations between all Indian tribes and the whites. And he began by recounting all the wrongs perpetrated on the Indians by the pale faces since the landing of Columbus. He related how the white man had beguiled the Indians along the Atlantic coast to parts with their lands for a few trifling beads and little fire water, leaving them beggars, vagabonds, peons, and strangers in their own lands to be scorned and despised by their pale-faced neighbors. He told how the Shawnees had and other Northern tribes were being stripped of their patrimony. He laid down the principle that the great spirit had given the Western hemisphere to all red people in common and that no particular tribe had anything more than the right of possession to the lands any lands and therefore asserted any relinquishment of title by one tribe to be null and void because many of the owners had not joined the transfer. These wrongs, he declared, had been made possible by ingenuity of the whites and attacking only one tribe at a time. So they didn't attack, attack everybody because then they have a unity, a unified tribal Indian front coming at them, but if they do one at a time, they can get one treaty at a time. <clears throat> but if all Indians would join and combine their forces in one attack at one time, the white man could be driven back over the mountains where he came. Mm. Then the golden opportunity was now at hand to join hands with the British and scourge from their revered hunting grounds, eternal, eternally the hated pale face. He closed his eloquent address with a stirring appeal to the patriotism of the Choctaw and Chickasaw, asking if they would await complete submission or would they not join hands and fight beside the Shawnees and other tribes rather than submit. Peaceful slavery or dangerous freedom? You gonna fight with us or you gonna completely submit, man? Cause that's what's gonna happen. Eventually Tecumseh's purpose had been fully accomplished his magnetic words seem to arouse every vindictive sentiment within the souls of the Choctaw, Choctaw and Chickasaw Wars. So they was feeling them at first. Their savage enthusiasm had been stirred to white heat when Push Mataha calmly strode before the council fire and began his wonderful reply to Kumse's speech. <laughs> And that's where we picked up last time at, you know what I mean? He's, he's just going to say, hey, man, how are you going to bring us peaceful people to war? <laughs> we don't have no beef with the whites. <laughs> you 
He says, oh, man, this this shiny orator has betrayed in vivid picture the wrongs inflicted on his and other tribes by the ravishes of the pale face. The candor and fervor of his eloquent appeal breathe a breath or breathe the conviction of truth and sincerity. And as kindred tribes, naturally, we we sympathize with the misfortunes of his people. Oh, we feel you, man. We feel you, brother. But then he's going to say, I'll see you on the battlefield. I'm fighting with the whites. <laughs> but we're kindred tribes, which means we are family. This is a family talk we have, man. We can, you know, address the shortcomings of our nation, and we can address the shortcomings of your nation, especially when it led to the downfall of all of us. Naturally, we sympathize with the misfortunes of his people. I do not come before you in any dis disputation either for or against these charges. So I'm not really here to even argue, you know, if they've done good to you or not. <laughs> but it's my purpose to contradict. It is not my purpose to contradict any of these allegations against the white man. I'm not even going to contradict it. You know what? I'm just going to say we're friends. We have a treaty. But neither am I here to indulge in any indiscreet denunciation of him, which might bring down upon my people unnecessary difficulty and embarrassment. Because we made treaties. Because we made treaties. So I'm not here to go against your allegations of the white man, but I'm damn sure not here to, you know, uh, fight him because I don't want my people at harm. You know, I don't want my people embarrassed. War with some alien host seeking the destruction of the Choctaw Chickasaw? My fellow tribesmen, nah. None of these are the enemy we will be called on to me. Nope, they're not my enemy, they're my friend. If we take up arms against these whites, we must of necessity meet in deadly combat our daily neighbors and associates in this part of the country near our homes. We don't want no smoke. How about now? Choctaw, how about now? Chickasaw, how about now? Delaware, how about now? Miami, how about now? I don't think you had a choice. Well, I guess slavery is a choice, but if you wanted freedom, there was no choice but to fight with the Comsay, man. If the Comsay's words be true and we doubt them not, then the Shawnee's experience with the whites has not been the same as that <laughs> of the Choctaw. These white Americans buy our skins, our corn, our cotton, our surplus. We eating over here. We're eating. We got guns and tools. Man, they, they hook us up, man. We in the house. We house niggas now. We house niggas now. It is true we have befriended them, but who will deny that we have been abundantly reciprocated? They have given us cotton gin simply, which simplified the cleaning and sale of our cotton. I mean, come on, I can't, I can't even do this no more, man. But just know that <laughs> the Choctaw and Chickasaw delegation who has ever gone to St. Stephen's, right? This is Esteban Managa. Esteban is venerated as Saint Esteban, Saint Stephen, because he led them right through how we cool with his uh, turncoat Indians. He was murdered <laughs> by the Nagas that said, uh, nah, man, you, you can't have, you can't steal our women, you can't steal our turquoises. You can't bring us no more decorations and weapons of death. So they called him the first uh, martyr, Christian martyr in America. Black ass Esteban, <laughs> St. Stephen, Black Stephen is venerated as St. Stephen. It's Estebanico, 
who was on the same side as these Choctaw Moors. You seen the picture? Is you seen the picture? So it marked in marked contrast with the experience of the Shawnees. It would be seen that the whites and Indians in this section are living on friendly and mutual beneficial terms. Forget not, O oh Choctaw and Chickasaw, that we are bound, that we are bound, we are bound in peace. Treaties of peace and French. We are bound in peace to the great white father at Washington. George Washington is called the great white father, my not by the Choctaw, by a sacred tree. <laughs> and the father has never violated that treaty and the Choctaws have never yet driven to the necessity of taking up the tomahawk against him and his children. You know, our father, this white father, we trust him. We don't want to raise a tomahawk against him. We have no such cause, the Choctaw and Chickasaw have no such cause, either real or imaginary. But rather it is a question of carrying on that record of fidelity and justice for which our forefathers ever proudly stood in doing that, which is best calculated to promote the welfare of our own people. Yeah, my fellow tribesmen, we are a just people. We don't just take up the war path without a just cause and honest purpose. So these people being over here, slaughtering and stealing your land, is not a just cause. The coon say over here shaking his head. Damn, damn, damn. The great white father at Washington, damn, damn, damn. Sacred treaty. And the great spirit will punish those for breaking their words. So because you made a treaty with the devil, you can't break that because the great spirit will punish y'all. So here's the fear. And then later he says, anybody that wants to fight with the coon say, <laughs> you're going to be killed. Anybody who wants to fight for freedom, you're going to die. Yeah, man. We're on mutually beneficial terms. We are living friendly with these whites. <sighs> We are a peaceful people. Let's go. Let go. So this is what's going on, man. This is what this migration is it's really hitting for. This migration, you know, had the protection of Pushmataha, the Choctaw, the Chickasaw, the Delaware, all these treaties were in favor of this migration. Is glaciation. <laughs> well, I don't know if they were in favor of the glaciation, but they sure were in the Little Ice Age. They have profits for themselves looking out for themselves, not for all black people, but for their tribes. And the ones that wanted no part in this confederacy with the hijack is not protected under these treaties at all. What about now? Y'all want to fight now? You still trust the great white father Washington? He's still good to you. Washington is the Washita. <laughs> oh boy. It's getting too good to us, man. The great white father. The great white father in Washington is the Washita. It's a more and more war, dog. We're making our way to this dismount. 
remember my naga. I mean, you you might be asking how how these nags get into this man. Isaiah twenty nine, verse eight, and it shall be as when a hungry man dreams, and behold, he eats, but he awakes, and his soul is empty. Or as when a thirsty man dreams, and behold, he drinks, but he awakes, and behold, he is faint. And his soul has appetite, so shall the multitude of all the nations be that fight against Mount Zion. The treaties, the confederacies, the multitude of nations that fight against you. Stupefy yourselves and be stupid. Blind yourselves and be blind, you that are drunken but not with wine, that stagger but not with strong drink. How do we get like this? How do we get drunken? How do we get blind and stupid? How do we start staggering? making these decisions, choosing down, not choosing up. For Hawaii has poured out upon you the spirit of deep sleep. Nagas couldn't choose up if they wanted to, man. That's why I don't blame nobody. That's why I can't point no fingers at Tribes that's looking out for themselves, man. We were looking out for ourselves first, man. But we weren't looking out for ourselves. We started, you know, looking out for these other powers before ourselves. <coughs> man. Hawaii put us in a deep sleep. Put brother against brother. It's not their fault. It's our own fault. I ain't mad at nobody. I ain't got no grudge against nobody, man. To this day, I got folks that really done me wrong, but it's my fault. You know what I mean? You got to take responsibility. We got to take responsibility. A while has put us in a deep sleep because of our, in, how you say, uh, iniquity, right? Our out of coldness has closed your eyes, which is how you got blind. Awa closed your eyes. Awa poured out upon you the Ruach of sleep. How does it say in this other translation here? For Hashem has poured out upon you the Ruach, Tarde Ma, spirit of deep sleep. Tarde Ma, the Ruach Tarde Ma, and has closed your in Naim or your eyes, namely that of your Nevi'im and your heads, your seers, as he covered. Wow. So we got a Ruach Tardy Ma, a spirit of deep sleep, and it led us to all this treaty business. It led us to all this infighting. We had the, the three fires canceled. We had the council popping off. But because of this Ruach Tardy Ma, Nagas couldn't agree, Nagas couldn't tribe up. We were in a deep sleep, and we're just not coming out of it. We're just now returning to Sikawa and our priest Khan, our Presta, to come trembling to Hawa in the end of days. The three fires council traditionally, we are known as the Nesh Nabek, man, man sent down from above. That's prophet talk, right? A confederation nation, confederate nation comprising of the Ojibwe, Odawa, Badawadmi, Patawatomi, 
Good luck to the fam that linked the pot that were told me with, you know, the whole entire um Concord Key region, man, popping off. So you have the OJ Bui, the Adawa, the Patawatomi, which is directly connected with the Kankaki. Our Confederacy is referred to as the Three Fires Council, recognizing that each tribe function as brethren to serve the alliance as a whole. The OJ Bui, our eldest kinsmen, were first in igniting the flames of council. They are the keepers of the medicine and faith. Mm, kind of like the Levites, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Entrusted with the sacred scrolls and teachings of our ancient Medawin, Medawin Lodge. The Adawa were second in to build a fire as one people. They are the keepers of the trade, responsible for providing food and goods to the nation. In the past, they commissioned and conducted large hunting trading expeditions that created intertribal and later European alliances devoted to the council and their duty to the people. They were fierce warriors and protectors of the vast trade network controlled by the Nishnabek and the Potawatomi. We are the youngest brother and last to build our own fire. The translation of our name refers to our duty to the council Keepers of the fire, Patawatomi, are responsible for protecting and nurturing the Neshnabek Council fire, for it is at the root of our culture and defining to us as a people. Still today, we are called upon to rekindle the flames of our past, lighting the path to our future as Neshnabek. Anaga, will you light the fire? <laughs> Will you rekindle the fire? Will you keep the flames burning? Will our people remember their duty as keepers of the fire? Keeping that fire burning means you keep that fight going. So mainly, you know, you had this, uh, uh, what is it? Adawa, Adawa, Ojibwe, and Patawatomi. And you can read more about these keepers or maintainers of the fire. I'll leave these links for you. Check them out, man. Dig on it, man. Because, you know, they were joining together, man. These one Wyandots, Algonquins, Nis, Nipissing, Sax, Meskawaki. You know, Tecumseh had his own confederacy. In the Mongol history, it'll be called the Kane, right? <laughs> the Kane is the confederacy. Priests to the Patawan told me, shared their suffering faith. Man, you know, this here, you know, another one to dig on a little backstory of the Patawan told me, man. And, First Europeans to establish friendly relations with the Potawatomi or people of the small prairie were Jesuit black robes, right? Missionaries, 1640. For the next 120 years, these Jesuit baptized their children, offered mass, anointed their sick, bestowed extreme unction upon the dying. 60 years after the black robes. Remember that uh, Cobra drop, man, that, that dragon drop, talking about these black robe hijacks, man, it's the same thing. Ceased missionary work and left the pot that would tell me a Baptist minister from Fort Wayne. Here comes the Wayne Treaty. Met with Chief Menomini and his people. Many were even hostile to this version of Christianity. <laughs> So he's a Catholic coming out here. They say, well, that's strange, which seemed at odds with the way they understood the means to salvation. Elders among them still told stories of the almost mythical black robes. Oh, yeah, you're going to have to dig on this Protestantism, Catholicism, and these black robes and how that differed, you know, and 
I mean, you know, all of it led to a trail of death. The book Trail of Death, Letters of Benjamin Marie Petit, includes correspondence from Pakokan, including this petition <clears throat> restated an American minister wished to draw us to his religions, but neither I nor any of my village wished to send our children to his school. Nah, because they're going to come back weak. Not being able to fend for themselves, think tribally, no culture. Nor to his meetings, we have preserved the way of prayer taught our ancestors by the black robe who used to be at St. Joseph. Yeah, these black robes left a trail of death. And for the dismount, you know, I make sure you get some drop on this Benjamin as well. Great place to pick up next time. You know, going even deeper on this part that were told me, because, you know, again, they are directly connected with this Kankakee region. The Pata Watomi teach their children about the seven grandfather teachings of wisdom, respect, love, honesty, humility, bravery, and truth towards each other in all creation, each one which teaches them the equality and importance of their fellow tribesmen and respect for all nature's creation. The importance of patience and listening as it follows the water spider's journey to retrieve fire for the other animals to survive the cold. As an important part of the Kumse's Confederacy, Potawatomi warriors took part in the Kumse's war. They rock with tech, right? War of 1812 and Pure's War. Pure's War is another one to dig on. All this is during 1812, man. We got to go within 1812 to these separate wars. All one war, though. Their alliances switched repeatedly between Great Britain and the United States as power religions shifted between the nations and they calculated effects on their trade and land interests. At the time of the war in 1812, a band of Pata Watomi inhabited the area near Fort Dearborn where Chicago developed. All right, so these Potawatomis were originally kicking it in Chicago, led by the chief Blackbeard, Blackbird. All right now you got the Chicago Blackhawks, right? <laughs> Damn. So there's the Blackhawks is named after really this chief Blackbird, man. And Nuskatome. A force of about 500 warriors attacked the U.S. evacuation column, leaving Fort Dearborn. They killed most of the civilians and 54 of the captain's force and wounded many others. George Ronan, the first to graduate of West Point to be killed, first graduate of West Point to be killed in combat, died in ambush. The incident is referred to as the Fort Dearborn Massacre, a Potawatomi chief named Muk Topoki, or Black Pheasant, <laughs> counseled his fellow warriors against the attack. Later, he saved some of the civilian captives who were being ransomed by the Potawatomi. Come on, man. Yeah, in the United States Treaty period, the Potawatomi history began with the Treaty of Pairs. 18 or 1783, which so-called ended the Revolutionary War. I don't think so. It looked like it was all happening. The Potawatomi had a decentralized society with several main divisions based on geographic locations, Milwaukee or Wisconsin area, Detroit or Huron River, St. Joseph River, and the Kankakee River. And we got, you know, briefly how, you know, a lot of these tributaries and stuff have been altered. You know, these damn dams, man, damned up the place. It's not what it used to be. Tippecanoe, Wabash River, Illinois River, Lake Pure, Del Des Plaines, Fox Rivers, all inhabited by the Potawatomi. It's Kankakee, though. <laughs> Seems to hold a lot of the key. 
And this is what the coon says fighting for, man. The Potawatomi's holding down the con- con- key. The Potawatomi is holding up the con- con- key. And this Kankaki, you know, is right there near Morocco, right? So it got moored up, you know what I'm saying? So how are they not the direct beneficiaries of all the wars, of all the death, of all the treaties? I mean, how are they not benefiting as they're peacefully migrating to, into your lands, man? They said about 10,000 people were part of this. Ben Ishmael, man, you might as well triple it, man. <laughs> and when Tacom say only has 500 Nagas going against 5,000, imagine if the tribes of Ishmael was by his side. Add another 10,000, just add another 5,000 to Tacom say's army, and you got victory, man. That's all it would take. That's all it would have taken. That's it. Damn dams, man. I know we dug a little bit on the damn dams and the Kankaki torrents. What was it called? The Grand Rapids Dam or something? <sighs> the Grand Rapids Dam, I know. For the dismount. Was a dam located on the Wabash River. <laughs> Got my naga. Here's the Wabash River. Okay. They dammed up the place, right? Probably around this tip of canoe situation, right? Because the Wabaja went right through Prophet's Town and tip of canoe. Right through the Harmonic Mount. But they dammed up the place, right? Hmm. Where's this holy mount of harmonics today? Is it under the damn dam? Is it under the damn dam that dammed up the Wabash River on the state line between Wabash County and Knox County? Uh oh. U.S. states of Illinois and Indiana. Uh oh. The damn dam was built in the late 1890s by the Army Corps of Engineers. Stop. The U.S. Army dams up the place to improve navigation <laughs> on the Wabash River. The dam was located near Mount Carmel. Mount Carmel, which was also called in the script a holy mountain. And left to the Bro Nine Spiral is also on Mount Carmel in Utah. Same mountain range, you know, what's going on, man? But it's called a holy mountain. And we're just talking the holy mountains of harmonics. Elijah sent that dragon fire on the false prophets of Baal right there. Yes, yeah, sir. Let go. <laughs> yeah, man. You know, get these links. Prior to 1852, the Grand Kankaki March was the largest wetland in the area. 500 acres, man. Like we got before, 500 acres. Turn into 30,000 acres. 500,000 acres turn into 30,000 acres. Now they want restoration of the wetlands. You just destroyed 470,000 acres of wetlands. Just get that through your head, Paul. I'm talking about the American Holocaust. Copper color race foul here. 
now applied to the descendants of Europeans, hijack city, parasites, take the titles of the copper color, red ma, red ma, red ma, red ma, Remani. <laughs> oh yeah, we're just talking to pomegranate knives, man. Yeah, man. Talking new beginnings. Yeah, now they want to hijack up the place, man. We we know we talking pomegranate now, but you see what they do to our legs. <laughs> you see what they do to our legs, right? You see what they do to the legs in real time. Get out of here, man. Hijack city. I got to subscribe to you to get pomegranate job. <laughs> yeah, we know what it is, man. It's all good. We already got it. The Rimon <laughs> Hebrew pomegranate. We already got it. The Hebrew for both pomegranate and grenade is the Rimon. And we're just talking about the red mine. Copper color race is found here. Now they want to restore the marshes. Restore. But what's under these waters, these damn dams, man, have sunk in Naga cities. Kankaka is now about sports attractions, man. <laughs> They popping off, man. Tourism. What have they done to the indigenous lands? Look at them, man. Looking like straight up hijack city. Look at them, man. Just look at them, man. This ain't normal, y'all. This ain't normal to look this ugly, man. You know what I'm saying? This ain't normal for people. Look at this guy. Look at it. This ain't normal to have this many ugly people in one photo, man. I'm just trying to tell you, man. You're talking parasites, man. All right? I'm just keeping it real, man. Potawatomi Indians ceded their land to the U.S. government in the Treaty of the Camp Tipcanoe. This is well after the death of the Kumsay. They ended up giving their land up. And they left the Kankaki Valley. And here comes Ishmael, 1905, all right, 1800s, they left the valley. Ishmael migrates. <laughs> here they go. Benefiting off the destruction of our people. Ain't that some shit? Recon the Kankaki, Kankaki tour. All right, there was a big flood going back 19,000 years. They're bringing in the ice sheets. We're talking glaciation. I mean, maybe it's all one thing. Point of origin of the flood of Lake Chicago. Landscape of Chicago still shows the effect of the torrent, particularly at the Kankaki River State Park. 4,000 acres, primarily in Kankaki. They just got hypothesis about floods, man. They really don't know. You know what I mean? They don't have no conclusion. It's just a hypothesis. Before the tour in the valley of the Kankaki River near the city of Kankaki, Illinois, was neither deep nor broad. It was a wide plain of Marseilles, Marseilles drift with a small river. The early outflow spread across the plain at its highest level. The torrent found channels in the Menuka Ridge followed across the ridge to the drift plain in the west. But he's talking Kankaki. And this is a nice 28-page document you can dig on to get further drop on the Kankaki yesterday and today. And uh, like I said, you want to get your geological drop on and really 
see this beautiful wetland that used to have so much life, so much wildlife, my knock. Yeah, I mean, when they take out 400,000 acres of wetlands, how much life did they kill? You're talking about the Grand Con. The Grand Con. <laughs> Ka -ki. What does this wetland, they call it? What is this river? What is this water got to do with the Grand Con? It's a 93-page document digging on it. So those are great places to dig on when you want to go deeper. We're talking Kanka. And even in the Hindu flow, you know, they got this Kanka connection. Some type of Kanka river torrent going on as well, right? Commemorative site for the Nag Nag, Nari Nag groups. The Nagas is always connected with the Kanka. What's it got to do with the Kanka key? <laughs> I can't make this stuff up. What's it got to do with the ganja? Because the Kanka is the ganja. These Kanka key towns vanish with hardly a trace. So yeah, with that changing of the waterways goes more disappearing of Naga towns like the ghost towns in America's West. Lost towns have vanished, leaving hardly a trace. You know, dig on these Naga lands that went up missing, man. But these damn dams like the great uh, Grand Rapids Dam, right? Damn, damn, damn. Nothing but dams. <laughs> Nothing but damming up the place, man. For the dismount, we'll get it here. You know, we just got about this Benjamin Pratt. He has his documentation on his Patawatomi Catholic missionary at the Twin Lakes. Served from 1837 to 1838. All right. Trained as a lawyer. Okay. Traveled to New York with a group led by Bishop Simon Brew, first bishop of the Catholic Dionysus, Dionysus of Vincennes, Vincennes. Petit was seen to Vincennes, sent to Vincennes, Indiana, where Bishop Brew ordained him as a Roman Catholic priest. So then what? He comes on over here. <laughs> well, he's already over here. <laughs> Father Petit was known for his compassion towards the Potomac. Parish, parishioners join them on their forced march to the new reservation lands. Oh, they loved him, right? He was just their, their uh, private priest, right? So you don't have your con no more. Now you need their father petite. They kill your cons and give you a petite father. <laughs> kill the strong con, give you a petite father. The Potomac Trail of Death marked an in honor of Father Petit at St. Philip Duchess Duchenne's Park in Lynn County, Kansas, dedicated September 28, 2003. His experience and observations of his missionary work, man, hijack city, man. Super missionary, huh? Yeah. So you got it. <laughs> Something happened, man. And it appears to be a worldwide famine, worldwide drought, worldwide ice age. All around this time of European contact, treaty on treaty, more on more war. Whatever the cause, the effects were pronounced. <laughs> we don't know. Yeah, you do. Yeah, you do. Even in China, they was feeling this. Then, as now the most populous county in the world, the Ming Dynasty fell in 1644, undermined by, among other things, erratic harvest in Europe, rivers and lakes, harbors froze. They had frost fears because it was so cold.
just to know that this climate change when they came invading let you know that Hawaii exists, man. That things changed drastically when the hijack, you know, went around, went about our destruction. You know, this parasite went around spreading pestilence. It caused Ama to show her displeasure, the earth to show the pain and the mourning of the bloodshed of the righteous ones, of the treasured ones that they've cut off from being a nation. Hurricanes, everything, they're feeling it all. So many people died of disease in the Americas after the arrival of Columbus, 56 million, according to the latest research. What? 56 million Nagas died because of disease? or because of the more and more war? Or is it all the same thing? Little Ice Age was a cold period that stretched from the 16th to the mid 19th century. You know, dig on the charts, man. I mean, just see that it's off the charts, it's off the chain and how could it be correlating and not correlating at the same damn time. Floods, famine. You got floods and you got drought at the same damn time. It's crazy, man. You got heat and you got cold at the same damn time. Again, these years, 1300 to 1850. Right during Ishmael's migration, right during Columbus and then, right during the time they dropping you off, off the slave boat, right? Or right during the time of the Shikamagua, Shikamagua, Shikamagua War. The Kumsay's War. Pack ice expanded far south into the Atlantic, making shipping to Iceland and Greenland, impossible. For months on end. Yeah, man. Get the links in the drop, drop, chatter, chat to chat, chatter, like I said. You got these jabronis trying to tell you something, man, about this ice age for the dismount. Let's get it. Press the 88, 89 coming in hot. A lot why. Drop Nation, we way up, man. We way up. What we talk about, man. Let's go. Yes. Hello, everyone. My name is Rosalba. I help support NASA's Office of STEM Engagement at the Goddard Institute for Space Studies in New York City. And I just want to quickly share with you a few resources for further exploration related to pictures. So I posted some links in the chat related to these resources. First, I want to share with you about the Global Ice Viewer and uh, Images of Change, and then also a very cool animation that is called NASA Climate Change the rise and fall of ice age glaciers. So the first one, Global Ice Viewer, is an interactive tool that lets you access these visuals to learn about how climate change has affected glaciers, sea ice, and continental ice sheets worldwide. It also lets you learn about the satellites and the instruments that look at this. The next one is Images of Change. So this is a gallery that features images where you can say, when you can see very, very dramatic changes. Some of them are related to climate change, some are not. Uh, the one that I'm showing right now on this screen is um, the Hilham Glacier Mount in Greenland. But there are many other images that you can access and you can see the before and after um, the dates that the images were taken. So a pretty cool uh, website that I recommend for you to explore. And the last one is- 
And you see all this melting in Greenland and all this stuff, man. I don't think Greenland had ice before this little ice age, my nage. Let's go. It's an animation from NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory that lets you kind of turn back clock 122,000 years and kind of like place a camera above the North and the South Poles and see how these massive um, sheets of ice thicken and thicken over time. So something that may be interesting for you to learn more about glaciers and how they change. And that's it for me. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Rosalba. Okay, so we have one question in the uh, Q&A box from Dennis. Um, and the question is, how does a geologist find a date for historic glacier expansion? Um, there was a slide about chemical data, but Mike, if you um, went, would like to uh, weigh in on that, that'd be great. Yeah, that's that's a great uh, question. Obviously, it's, that's a that's a key thing, right? That's why when Mathay defined the little ice age, he, the, back then the scientists weren't even sure when it occurred. So there, there's there's a, a few ways we do it. Uh, two of the main ways that we figure out when the glaciers were bigger or when they when they shrunk is when they advance in some places like this is common in, in Switzerland actually and in other areas they advance over trees and they kill the trees and they incorporate that wood from the dead trees into their deposits so then when the glaciers shrink and go back to where they are like for example now if you walk around the sediments or deposits left by the glaciers when they were bigger you can sometimes find these pieces of wood like you could tell they don't know what they talking about pieces of wood and they're gonna date the wood and see how big the glacier is man they don't know what they go they don't know what's going on with these glaciers and i could use that to figure out how long they've been exposed to the air so basically what i do is i figure out how long sediment or glacier debris or deposits have been when the glacier put them on the landscape and how long they've been exposed to the air and that tells me when the glacier is bigger so. <laughs> So the, those two <laughs> methods, we, we call it uh, cosmogenic dating or surface exposure dating, where we can measure how long things have been exposed to the air at the surface of the Earth. Mm. Um, I see a second question. Great. Yeah, if you want to go ahead with the second question, um, that would be great. Let's back Close it up. To the air. So basically what I, it's a, a good um, sunburn, sorry. Whoa, 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 whoa. You might find in Central Park just lying about, just lying about, right? Because they were so big that people didn't move them. And uh, it's, it would take a lot to explain in detail, but basically, what, when something's exposed to the air, uh, it causes chemical changes in the surface of the rock or anything like our, like our skin. As you know, when you're exposed to the sun, you get chemical changes in your skin. It's, it's uh, sorry. Can't speak anymore. It's just, it's a, a good uh, sunburn. Sorry. Man, Hijack City is glitching out trying to talk. <laughs> Glaciers, man. Go get the drive. Tall Tree, what it do? Legend DJ, Big Ten, what it do? Tie Battle Poetry, keeping them going. Yeah, we had a nice marathon, man. And look out for the, for the fifth wave, man. We popping off. Shabbat Show 2.0, Fresh Out Shabbat. We popping off the fifth wave. Look out for the new schedule, man, and the water for your patience with us. You know, we're tribing up over here. It's a lot of moving parts, but it's all happening thanks to y'all, man, and thanks to your steady contribution to support Joy World, Brendan Savala, Michael Sanders, man, what it do, Mikael, excuse me, Groovy Huey, man. Contessa Taylor, Aqua Tai, Bad Zion, Tracy Slope Coombs, Zion Trey, Zion Marley. Man, Brendan Zavala, man, I see you, man. All the repeat contributors, we appreciate you. Because at the end of the day, we need a fence, we need a boundary. And, uh, you know, it means a lot. You know, it's more than just symbolic to us. It means a lot to build. They've done so much tearing down, my naga. That it's our turn, it's our time, you know what I'm saying, to build. So keep building with a naga, man. And keep leaving your great comments, man. And, you know, keep 
drop it a drop because we appreciate it. We read it. We dig on it. <clears throat> you know, yeah, we <laughs> we hitting the press to, you know, straight up, man. We, we going to press the 100. So uh, get your boot bones. <laughs> Don't buckle your boot bones, man. You know what I'm saying? The drop's about to be dropping nonstop. And we're going all the way to press the 100. We're continuing all our flow. And we're doing it because of you, man. All praise to why drop nation you're keeping us going man you're keeping us going man hey hop to all the cons we are the fountain of you hey isaiah brown you already know appreciate all you do <laughs> but this one is one i can't bear to watch i know so well of the backstabbing that has taken place and which still persists to this day <sighs> This is what we're talking about. Creole Kid, where they do, Lawrence Richardson, all the Niners leaving, you know, great additions to our conversations. Tammy Lynn, where they do, my name in spirit is Acacia. Hey, pop off. We're talking to Cod again, Acadia. They love to Boston of Baltimore, man. He's over there wave surfing, man. He's over here in 2017, Luciana. Yeah, she said, uh, pondering on 88, going to take down my thoughts, keep focused. We all driving up. We all got to focus, man. Dragon Slayer, what it do. I hey, man, hope you ain't a real Dragon Slayer, man. Come on, man. <laughs> he said, look at the Code Keepers. Oh, wow. Patois. Family something looks, something, some things look better now. Jamaican people chat Patois like myself. <laughs> He's talking about the code keepers, man. Hey, out to my Jamaican Nagas, man. King Brian Dandrop for my migration path. I'm following the triangle, having made it west, but born in Florida. So you're going to go all the way around, man. The west is calling you, man. All right, bro, man. Holla at your koala. Iowa, Hawaii, 10SC. See the 10 tribes. Whoa. Scrillionaires. Popping off Alabama, Allah, Hawaii. Uh oh. Derek Barry, Amos three and three. Once that happens, you become exceptional to accomplish more. Yeah. Because Hawaii has, you know, made sure we got purged from our iniquities. More than 91,000 dams in the U.S., these damn dams, man. More than 15,600 hazardous dams along. With imagine how much flourishing plant life before these rivers and streams were clogged up, America truly had the beauty. Flourish plains. Now there's desert. 91,000 damn dams. My Nagas is dropping that drive. Charles Johnson, man. Peace. Amaru Khan. Peace, peace. Solar disc. Soulful. Soul, soulfully sowing seeds, man. No doubt calling Israelites black is a by word. <laughs> but so is Israelite. <laughs> but let's go. Otherwise, you're colorblind. The prophetic Hebrew history book was transcribed by the conquerors and colonizers. Conquistadors inserted themselves. Yeah, man. They always try to hijack. We see it clearly. Kahim, great job, bro. We always been here and they know it. Man, Lawrence, what it do? Hunter, what it do? My surfboard beat up, but I haven't seen waves like this since the water broke. Oh, wow, it's dope. Templar says, sorry to interrupt the classroom. Been, been binge watching through this press to flow, but here I have to ask, is this plague the Hebrews? Is glaciation the same as what a Hebrew would call a holocaust? Wouldn't these be the Moors who bent the knee to both Joshua and Suleiman? Quick reminder in the Barbary Treaty, 1787 equals 1200. Templar been saying it. Same year. Same year. The Little Ice Age dates of 1100s to 1300s. With that, all lines up with the duplicated history we drop. You see, my naga, while we got depressed to John 88. While we're on 89 and while we're going to 100, and once we get to 100 on this YouTube platform, then please believe you know where to find us from there, man. You know what I'm saying? We're going to be exclusively kicking it, chilling back, you know, in our spot. 
in our secluded alcove, man. <laughs> Back to the drop, man. Back to the drop. Man, they over there digging on that Wong Kong right now, live on the radio. Falling back, man. Dragon Child, man. Hey, we in code. We do it for Nagaville. And you know what I'm saying? Just know we're transitioning to here to be here exclusively. You know what I'm saying? So all our job from Preston John 101 and all. <laughs> You know, it's going to be right here. You know, we'll probably do snippets and have the full drops right here. So we don't need nobody else's censorship, nobody else's jam ups, man. You come over here and you're going to get that drop just like this exclusive. We don't care about the algorithms. You don't care about, you know, the, their numbers and oh, this many views. Nah, we don't care about the views. We're just going to drop the videos for the tribe tribe for free for my noggins and if you want to support pre-order your press the pack too they're almost in it and you know we almost got the shipment in from our distributor my noggin we could fill them up with the next 20 press the johns i think this one got 61 through 82 hey and then we got you know the next press the three with all the you know additional drops man all the links and books that we're adding to the series we're going to keep them in our time capsule keep putting them out for you and future press the packs. And my naga, I mean, you know, <laughs> look out for the uh, chop and screw reconstruction pack listening party. We partying on the land, bumping that screwed and chop. Love the nine spiral, yo, Seth, for real. Get the reconstruction pack. It's our time capsule. It got the drop on, it got detox drop, uh, you know, live, you know, drop videos. Uh, radio shows, my naga, from Yosef to Real Nine Spiral, including the most comprehensive, uh, you know what I'm saying, music pack, along with the mob pack. I mean, a whole lot of songs, a whole lot of music. And this one also has the chop and screw version of each song on it, all in 432 hertz, swag frequency, 32 in the drop shop. You know what I'm saying? My pack is popping off as well, man. Over 50, 60 tracks, man. Get your my pack one, man, and pop off with a naga, man. This is what we do. This is where we at. Get all the drop and continue to be M-H-O-E. Shout out to the Tribe Tribe. Man, we come a long way, ain't we? <laughs> a naga, we come a long way. Build it for Joy World. Hey, I hopped it all the lands popping off. Copy land, what it do? Naga Hill, what it do? Now be go farm, we all the way up. The fence building Nagas is still building. Coming down the other side, look how beautiful and level this fence is. And we'll continue to add our pickets and do what we do, man. What goes on inside our fence? Hey, we tribing up. Hawa, hawa. We keeping the water flowing. It takes a lot to build. You got to have builders love to con club, eh? Still out there popping off. Support so we can keep getting materials to the cons. You know, we're getting more posts, more pickets. You know what I'm saying? We're going to start getting the siller, you know, start sealing up the wood, make sure we protect our wood and all that drive, man. It's beautiful. This is what we're doing, man. I mean, this is what you doing, you know what I'm saying? Everything we're doing is going towards our tent, <laughs> our tent of meeting for our cons. A high for your donations, A high for your support, and the water Managa for surfing the wave in the 88th installment of our, our, not there, our Preston John investigation. Shalom to the cons, aha, to the Shabbata, alawa. Wah. Wah.